All right. Um, welcome to a Gauntlet Hangouts event. We're playing um, Cthulhu Dark Green tonight. Um, we're playing the um, Delta Green scenario, A Victim of the Arts by uh, Dennis Detwiller. And we're using uh, Cthulhu Dark, or A Heck of Cthulhu Dark, uh, originally written by, um, uh, by Graham Walmsley. And we have the author of Cthulhu Dark Green here with us, uh, Justin, who is our fourth player and came into the game through the waitlist. So, yay, waitlist. Um, so, um, we start in 1995. Um, it's, you all know the time of year where the realization sinks in that the bright, beautiful, warm days are over. It's, it's very often at the end of summer and sometimes at the end of autumn, where um, you know the leaves all decided at that one day to get rid of their beautiful, um, the trees get rid of their beautiful leaves and turn into hands that claw at the sky, um, where the, the sun it, more often than not, it's just a pale ball behind dark clouds. And um, this year, it happened uh, around the 20th of October. You all got um, a message from, you all got an invitation to a night um, at the opera. Uh, and I would like to know from, I go from left to right, from uh, Justin. Um, how did you get the message, and how's your? Um, how do you prepare for a mission? Uh, for a mission? Uh, so I think that uh, you know Rachel is already an agent uh, she, of the CIA, and I think that she actually just gets a letter on her desk, um, and, and this this is just delivered by you know someone low in the in the agency who, who who's delivering mail, but. Um, uh, it, it may look like mail that was sent through the post office, but it was probably just, you know, handed off. Uh, this is this is kind of a dread, a dead drop uh, of, of sorts. Um, and how I prepare is I I know whenever I get this this mail to uh, write up uh, a request for 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 an operation to to my superiors, and a, as ridiculous as it might sound and as much as it might be like a cover they always approve it and so when you leave the house the house your um home situation look like is is somebody waving you goodbye <clears throat> is it um we have a painting at the wall that is from ikea with a paint you buy the frame and the paintings inside is um is it really like High class, middle class. What does it look like? It's not high class. I think I live in the D.C. area of the United States, and um, I live in the city, so I have kind of a modest living situation on a CIA salary. But uh, I, I do live with a dog, uh, a I'll say a golden retriever named Grizzly. Um, and I have, uh, there is, a, if, if we scan through my apartment, there is a picture frame of me and a man, and we look like we're in love, but there's no clear room for that person here. Um, it, it's a single, uh, I think it's a studio apartment with a twin bed. Um, and and they're, they're, they're obviously missing from, from the scenario. Awesome. So that was Rachel and... Um, uh, Kevin, how does Alan get his message? Alan gets his message. So he has his work pager, but he also has a personal pager. And his wife, Sarah, doesn't even know about this pager. <clears throat> and he just gets a series of numbers on that. And he knows when the certain prime number sequences that that means it's a, a mission and to, to expect to be contacted by uh, his handler. 
Um, and um, how do you prepare for a mission? Is it like, do you sit on the bed cleaning your gun or um, do you yeah, kiss? It's very much, you know, classic law enforcement. You see them getting out, you know, the bulletproof vest to wear underneath his clothes and putting a shirt on over that and cleaning his gun, putting a little holdout pistol down on the ankle, uh, ankle, um, you know, the handcuffs, all that stuff that goes on the belt. <clears throat> and uh, you see his wife kind of hovering uh, wordly in the background. Uh, and you can see that Sarah's looks like she's maybe five or six months pregnant. And she's ticked off because he's getting sent out on a fugitive apprehension mission. And she hates how those can be dangerous and also the amount of time he can be gone traveling for that. And so it's uh, pretty tense in the household as he's getting ready. He's basically saying, I don't know how long I'll be gone, but you know, duty calls. Ooh, and, um, then we have um, Dr. Lynette Wisniewski. Jasmine, how does she get her um, notification? Uh, yeah, she it uh, arrives in her laboratory in uh, like a little vial that uh, contains uh, samples of disease usually. So there is very little risk of someone just opening it. She, of course, recognizes it by the label, uh, unfolds the uh, piece of paper in there, reads it, and then incinerates it in the uh, medical incinerator she has around. And your home situation, how, how do you say goodbye or how do you prepare for the mission? Um, I think her home situation, she, uh, she has a, a big apartment, uh, mostly white walls, and it uh, seems like she moved in there like right from college and never uh, managed to uh, to fill it with all the stuff that uh, probably should be there. So, so it, it seems uh, like it's a bit unused. Uh, there's a lot of empty shelf space and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, some missing furniture. And yeah, she just uh, picks up uh, her, uh, yeah, a set of, uh, of clothing that's was, that was already there as like kind of a go back and uh, is on her way to the airport. It's uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like she spends much time at home, and the books on her shelves all are uh, medical texts. She, she might be some kind of a workaholic. Mm -hmm. And so the the, the <coughs> sequence, uh, the number sequence that you all get uh, is indicating um, you know the coordinates, uh, date, time of day. And then uh, a four-digit number that you can interpret as um, an entrance code, and um, probably. Um, and so uh, Rachel lives in the DC area. Uh, the, the coordinates point towards um, a storage facility in New Jersey. Um, so uh, Scott, um, how does it? How do you get the message? The phone rings and the bartender, my sister, Clara Taylor, answers it. And there is a numeric sequence that gets uttered into the phone. 350125. Clara sighs, yells to the back, Cass! Those damn numbers again. Because she knows that whenever someone calls and says numbers into the phone and she answers it that I grab my kit bag and I go. And the scene of getting ready is very simple. After a dig that went horribly wrong and very few, no one is really quite sure how, but there are only a handful of survivors and most of them are either completely mad or catatonic. Cass is dealing with a non-trivial amount of PTSD. And she lives in the back room at the dive bar that her sister owns. She sweeps up after hours. She makes sure no one robs the place. She has a tiny little cot. And it's literally a go bag. There's some toothpaste and toothbrush in it. There's 
cell phone, a couple of other odds and ends, just basic stuff that you would have had in a go bag in the 90s. She grabs her bag and sighs, takes the phone from Clara and says, I'm on my way, and leaves uh, the bar. Um, Kes, so um, tell me about uh, a night, and it can be when you, was a, when you were a kid, uh, or it could be recent, when you, uh, when Kes felt frightened in the dark. Well, that's every night. After dig seventy eight, I and mean, they, she was down in the Amazon, excavating what looked to be a Mayan temple. It was an a, just a staggering discovery. It was almost entirely preserved, and it happened at night. And there were screams and snarls that sounded like impossibly huge jaguars. None of the lights would work. There were fires, and that was about the only thing that you could see. And the, even then, all that you saw were flickering shadows as people were dismembered in ways that seem completely impossible in any understanding that we have of physics. She and, ran, and, that and that's the only reason that she got out reasonably unscathed. Reasonably being a relative term here. And, and that was probably the inciting event when uh, Delta Green got, um, you know, that you uh, came in contact with the organization. They figured if she managed to survive that and not completely lose her ability to function, that she might be useful. And they're sort of right and that's why she's a friendly and an outside agent and disavowable because i mean that dig went so badly that no reputable institution will ever hire her again and if she goes missing people are just going to figure that she dropped off the map or went walk about or something bad happened to her which given the way that she lives now is not too much of a stretch Awesome. So you all uh, arrive um, through different ways uh, in the evening at uh, the safe and store um, facility in uh, New Jersey. Um, there, there's a, like a, a fence around the whole um, facility. Um, there's these um, lights that um, that are spaced out between the, the uh, what's the plural of garage? Garages? Garages? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so there's either, either the bright light that shines to the entrance uh, of a garage or there's complete darkness. Um, and you all um, stand before uh, one of these um, boxes and um, I assume that you all know each other from at least one other um, mission. And um, could you quickly describe how your character looks like? So what do we see on screen when you, um, when you uh, stand before the, the garage? Uh, we start with uh, Rachel. So Rachel travels, uh, when she's on the mission, she's often wearing kind of conservative exercise gear. So like gray sweatshirt with a hood, uh, a baseball cap. Uh, she has sandy blonde hair that she ties up into a ponytail. Um, she looks like someone who would be going for a jog through like, you know, uh, a park or something. Uh, and a little buttoned up, but not in professional clothing, not, not in a suit or anything. And do you have clothes that um, that you could wear in order to um, be mistaken as a FBI agent? So, so could you dress up as a FBI agent? 
Yeah, part of the costume is like slung around my shoulders is a um, sports bag. And it's just, it's my go bag that's full of all kinds of stuff, including an all black, um, you know, cotton suit uh, that uh, she can toss on whenever she wants, you know, black, a white tie uh, and uh, every, pretty much all of her, all of her go bag stuff is in there. And um, how does uh, Helen look like? Helen's a <clears throat> burly African-American man, stands about 6'2", looks like he weighs around 220, maybe played some football in college. Um, always looks like he's glaring or angry or essentially has resting bitch face as it's referred to. And um, <clears throat> he typically uh, uh, wears like a sport coat uh, with slacks and a button down shirt. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on the mission might be dressed all in black if it's a night type of thing. But this, since he just had headed out, um, he's dressed in his regular thing, uh, tweed coat, black slacks, white shirt, tie. And, um, how does, let's see. Got the names. Uh, Rachel. No, no, we had just Rachel. Uh, how does uh, Dr. Lynette look like? Uh, Lynette is uh, like in her early 30s. She's uh, uh, she's fit, like, uh, yeah, someone who goes running or hiking. Her shoes, uh, um, yeah, confirms that uh, that impression. They are uh, shoes which, uh, which you can do go long distance uh, running and the uh, and uh yeah she wears those with uh with uh yeah slacks and uh, like a uh, black pullover and uh and a coat uh so yeah like a, like a smart casual look with uh with unusual but not uh, super uh uh strange shoes and uh yeah she her hair, her hair is uh like tied back in a in a bun and she uh wears glasses all right, and last but not least, uh, Cass, what do we see on screen? You see a woman walking up in, in jeans that, they're not fitted, they're loose. You know, you can tell that these are jeans that she can move in if she has to. She's wearing a t-shirt and a hoodie. She has her hair pulled back in a ponytail through the opening in the back of a ball cap. And she's wearing sunglasses, which is, unusual since it's dark and every once in a while you can catch a glimpse of her and you can see that her cheeks are a little bit puffy and red like she's been crying <clears throat> um it's all yeah it's also raining um and pretty windy and uh, when you punch in the coat the um the garage door opens and you can see um there's um there's a string that you can pull um and when you do so <clears throat> there's the uh, um what's it called like a neon tube is that a word like this old-fashioned uh neon lights um oh, fluorescent lights and tubes yeah um that that spring to life in this um you know it, it doesn't go on it it flickers in the, uh, in the beginning and you have the feeling that with every, you know, with every pulse, um, there's um, more and more shadows creeping behind the, the furniture and under the chairs, and uh, until um, the the really really bright light um, has uh, eradicated all the shadows, and what you see is uh, a lot of crap and miscellaneous. There's an obvious. Uh, there's a table with. Uh, a uh, FedEx um, parcel. Uh, there's a bottle of uh, Knob Creek with a post-it on it um, with compliments uh, markers. Um, there's a, a packet of Gitan cigarettes with two cigarettes missing and an ashtray with uh, ash, but the butts are missing. 
um, there's a locker, um, there's <clears throat> some kind of um, thing wrapped in uh, plastic in the corner with uh, and with chalk. It's written on the on the ground. Do not touch. Um, there's a, a Puma sports bag. Uh, there are a couple of black um, plastic bags. Um, but the, the main thing is obviously the FedEx uh, parcel. Uh, and if you open it, then you will find um, a couple of burner phones, fake IDs, and the following mission briefing that I will share with you. Hold on. Um, And maybe someone uh, can read it aloud so that the um, uh, people watching can see what's going on. So that's the uh, that's the mission uh, briefing for mission uh, operation element tree. Um, Justin, would you mind um, reading the, the the basic gist? No, I don't mind. Uh, so Rachel walks up to this FedEx uh, container and kind of pulls it open. And, and I have a sheet of paper, I assume. Um, it's for us. Looks like our objective here is to identify uh, the possible existence of an anomaly, to eliminate that threat, and to ensure the public ignorance. Let's see here. Uh, first thing, we need to meet Special Agent Dolbert Coleridge and Behavioral Analyst Sandra Lewis in Glen Ridge. You all got that? Good. Uh, we're going to take over a case for them. Timeline of events, September 15th, Dr. Carl Moretti, a local dentist, age 45, is found dead in a culvert near the edge of the Great Peconic Bay, just inside the property of a small park. On October 7th, Vanessa Hotvan, local librarian at Glen Ridge High School, age 41, she's found dead hanging from the branches of an oak tree at the school. October 21st, Lauren Harrogate, student at Glen Ridge High School, age 17, found dead, hanging 60 feet up on a large electrical tower near the State Highway 31 in the north end of town. The police had been alerted by an alarm triggered by a broken French door from the balcony of her room. Uh, mother, Sandra Harrogate, age 48, since been completely catatonic, incapable of communication of any sort, and moved to Swansea Psychiatric Facility, Marmontuck, Long Island. All the bodies seem to have shown signs of heavy mutilation. Head and spine removed. Gosh, ugh. The victims have an unidentified gray substance under their nails. Are you getting all this? The bodies of Moretti and Hotvan have suffered blunt trauma consistent with a fall from a great height. Refer to Dr. Stephen Santorini, medical examiner of Suffolk County for further information. And it looks like there's one friendly on this, on this case, a Dr. Jensen Wu, AMNH D Stacks. Wow. So we've got a live one here. What do you think? Do we have any glasses? <laughs> <laughs> there are four glasses uh, on the table. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Alan will pull the cork stopper out of the Knob Creek and look around at everyone and um, where there's yes nods. Pour me a, or a couple one. fingers. I give you nah, four fingers. Pour me a couple hands. <laughs> you I, I think I would. Uh, notedly hand the note off to agent Meyerhoff um, and point at all of the different like uh, 
the kind of like coroner's report elements of the report and like ask them if this any of this sounds familiar to you. I'm taking notes. I'm wondering what the nature of the hanging is. Is it be has it been hanging from the neck or uh, have they been hanging? Uh, and now just from a branch or something on that electrical wire, the the gray substance, of course, is of interest uh, for us. Uh, and uh, I wonder what uh, the, uh, what was it called? Uh, AMHH uh, thing uh, Dr. Jensen is working for. A M N H was uh, it was uh, so. Does anyone know, or should our characters know what this is? Yeah, I think your characters would know. Uh, it's the American Museum for Natural History. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, do we know how they were hanging? Were they hanging from the ankles? I mean, it says the heads and spine were removed, so. They obviously weren't hanging by the neck, or at least they weren't after they were, the head and spine was removed. I mean, was the head and spine removed post mortem, pre mortem? Yep, all good questions uh, to consider. So, what are our fake IDs? I'm taking a look at those. Um, so, <clears throat> um, one of you, I mean, you can. Um, you can pick your uh, identity and occupation. One of you will be an FBI agent taking over the case, and the others will be, um, I, don't, I don't know how you would call that, but they, um, you know, they're like the, the counselors or like, you know, specialists in their case, uh, in their field, um, taking over the case. Guess I'm a forensic researcher again. <laughs> and so it would make, yeah, go on. Uh, uh, Alan, aka Agent Marlowe, I think, puts his hand on the FBI ID and like, think this is me. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, we we do have a bit of a problem here. I mean, listen, you guys, with my background, I'm the one who should go to the Natural History Museum. But the problem is that with my background, there's no cover ID in the world that's going to let that, that's going to convince them that I'm not who I am. I am particularly around here, known. So the question is, do we want to kind of save my cover ID and just have me go poke around and have them assume that I'm, well, not assume incorrectly that I'm drunk and just sticking my nose into something weird? Or do we want to have somebody else handle that part of this investigation? Well, if uh, the doctor is a, is a friendly, she might know a thing or two and uh, might be uh, willing to talk to you as yourself uh, if we establish a contact. So you uh, we get her in, in contact with you. Uh, you don't show up at the museum. We uh, set up a meeting. You talk as yourself and... Uh, if we want, if we need to use your ID, uh, I'm sure the friendly will not be the one uh, to, yeah, to get in our way there. All right. Um. Next question, did I, Martyr? I hate to even ask this, but are we drawing arms? Of course, that's the last resort, but. I mean, are, are, Marlo. Are, are, Marlo's are we, like, yes. Are, are we being assigned sidearms or? Oh, um, well. So, well, 
Uh, you can definitely look around in the garage, uh, and if you do so, you find in the Puma sports bag, uh, you find four um, shotguns with uh, um, numbers filed off. This is a little excessive. Very excessive. Um, and there's also a locker. In the locker, there's something wrapped in um, bubble. What's it called? Like um, Bubble wrap? Bubble wrap. Uh, and there's a, um, uh, I'm not a gun expert. I, I say pistol. That's probably wrong with a, uh, with a silencer. I feel that Agent Martyr, um, and if you've, you've been on a case with her before, um, she doesn't, like, she's CIA. She, she's issued a gun, and uh, she, I, I think she understands the potential possibility of um contamination you know of a scene of a firing said weapon but it, it's a weapon of last resort to her so she's not super concerned about that and someone from the marshals would also have well weapons yeah but firing your service weapon on a, a yeah. side job uh not the best idea no. uh if i can give you that advice as someone who figures out uh guns have been fired yeah, I have to account for all my ammo and everything because there's a total chain of custody on that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think Marlo, well, like when that Puma bag gets unzipped and we see the sawed off shotguns, he'll just kind of shrug and zip it back closed and throw it in the back end of his Crown Vic uh, in the trunk, going, never know and poke around underneath the uh, plastic not the do not touch because i've learned that sometimes those messages are important but poking around uh some of the other stuff uh in the facility um yeah can we make a, like a five minutes break sure on the hour i like to have a, a break so see you in five minutes sounds good Yeah, Justin, I just got distracted by that puppet because it's it's such a great one. It's it's really great because um, guests come over and you know they see a stuffed animal, but then immediately when they put their hands inside of it and wiggle around the little arms, uh, mm -hmm. everyone everyone just becomes so delighted <laughs> the, by that aspect. It, it's weird because it doesn't stand up as well as some of the other puppets. Like it doesn't actually maintain it. It, it kind of slumps over time. But yeah. that actually just kind of makes it a little bit more endearing. Um, I would I would agree. <laughs> I for you, let's say I got I picked mine up at a toy store. Uh, probably a decade or so ago now. Uh huh. And it's just. I remember I, I, I saw it, I was kind of taken by it, and I picked it up and I started playing with it a little bit. And there was this little, eh, probably four or five year old girl. And she just started like kind of peering around the corner like, wait, an adult is playing with a puppet? <laughs> what? You, you, you're allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, just, I noticed it and started kind of poking around. And it's like, you know, the dinosaur started poking its head around the corner of the aisle at her and she's like wait what he, he, you get you know and it's i had my kid with me so it was not as weird as it otherwise might have been but yeah my, my kid actually now works in a different independent toy store that sells folk money's puppets and she calls me up whenever uh -huh. there's a new one like um my my favorite lately is the sea turtle um that, it's that's just, adorable Oh, it's got this, it's so expressive and it's got these flip, you know, you can control the front flippers. Um, the funny thing is, do you remember, uh, you remember David Letterman, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, okay, there was a, do you I remember the show that, that he had follow him with Craig Ferguson? Yep. Craig Ferguson used these puppets all the time on his show. Mm. So... They, they they got a fair amount of publicity out of that, but they just they make such great puppets. And 
considering the quality of them, they're really cheap. I just, I kind of nerd out over puppets sometimes. <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, there are some people who, who that, that moment of delight uh, that you yes. notice. I think there are people who really get into puppets because of, because of that moment. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, it's just, I, I don't know, the T-Rex is just so fun. I mean, it, it it's so easy to move the mouth so you can like make it talk to people. I mean, I geek out. I I love stuff like that. I love things that are well designed and well constructed and well manufactured, and that that hold up over time. I mean, these puppets. I've I've yet to see anything like even a stitch pop. I mean, I'm sure it can happen over time, but yeah. Got bunnies, squirrels, sea turtles. Well, um, we've got a shark. Shark's fun. Um, we have a narwhal. That was that was an interesting one to find with a horn. So that's like I said, we, we have something of a collection here. It sounds like it. I, I wonder how many I think I would if I were to get more, I think I would look for some fantastical creatures you know they they do have i think unicorns um and dragons they've added to the line but a lot of times they stick with more realistic interpretations of critters that are well maybe not broadly known but that that are not like you know a sea turtle it's not i don't think they're necessarily trying to do a specific type of sea turtle they actually have a, a really good website. It basically has a catalog of all the puppets that they've done, um, including ones that are no longer being manufactured. So it's, uh, you, you could treat it like Beanie Babies, I guess. Yeah, we started doing plushies for our uh, for our game line, uh, and they are throwing them in uh, crowdfunding and stuff. So now there are like plush uh, uh, animals of the the fantastic creatures from from the dark eye and stuff like that. That's nice. Yep, yeah. I have the kraken uh, around here. We also have a dragon, a griffin, and uh, two demons from the from the line. Like one is a flying eye, and the other is like a, a roped figure. But though they have a cute interpretation now. Awesome. It's. Uh... It, uh, every once in a while, I will either pick up a plushie for the kid or for my partner. Um, you know, just because it's fun. You know, it's something something lighthearted to do. So I'm always looking for interesting stuff. Like my partner collects. She really likes science and biology. And so she has taken it upon herself to start collecting the plush microbes of, for example, contagions, pathogens, STIs, that sort of thing. So it's, 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 I mean, that's adorable. I mean, it's, oh, oh I really like the printing on the underside of the tentacles for the suckers. That's a good detail. And the mouth, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a microbiologist, so I'm well aware of those, those disease plushies and, I like them quite a bit. It, it she like she uh, she just orders them off of Amazon, and sometimes she uses them as cat toys and just throws it, and the cat chases after. It. And it's like, no, please don't go chasing after mnemonic plague. <laughs> it gets silly around here. So you're a microbiologist in a lab for a university? No, I do corporate microbiology. Okay. Um, I, I do environmental analysis, mostly. Mm. In a small lab in, in Seattle, Washington. Like for environmental impact reports or? Uh, for air quality, mostly. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. um, we we identify uh, allergens and uh, mold spores a lot. Mm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I hear a lot of <clears throat> Ghostbuster jokes when I talk about that. <laughs> if I um, describe the the gray substance in a way that is non-scientific. I don't want to be corrected, Justin. <laughs> well, you're in luck because uh, Agent Martyr has n no clue. <laughs> That's great. All right, so um, let's see. Ellen was uh, looking at the, um, the bubble wrap. Um, and when you carefully um, remove uh, do you remove the the, the wrap? Yeah. Um, it says um, so. The the you unwrap it, and there is um, uh, a label saying um, Bacillus anthracis Amos strain. Oh shit! Don't like that. <laughs> and I look over at Agent Meyerhoff and I said, "I think they've got some of your stuff here." And I hand the vial over to Meyerhoff. Let's take a look. So, do I know what it says? Like what it means? Yeah, it's um, it's anthrax. Oh, that's such an, that's just Antrax. And like the metal band. No. <laughs> Marlo rolls his eyes. Um, so to um, as I promised, I will uh, push a little bit. Um, there are other wondrous things, uh, and uh, if at any stage of the investigation you need something, maybe it was in the in the green box. Who knows? Um, you do find um, four ABC uh, fire extinguish extinguishers, uh, and in the in these black bags, you find all kinds of dirty um, clothes, like um, I don't know, um, waitress uniforms and um, street what's it called, like um, uh, construction worker uh, clothes, and so forth. Anything, anything like a janitor's outfit or definitely a janitor's outfit or overalls. Cool, or maybe actually a like an electrician might be useful. I'm thinking so. Agent Martyr is thinking about the interviewing the psychiatric patient um, somehow. Uh, that that's something she she feels like she would be particularly good at. Um, and that might require getting access uh, either as, I guess, maybe even the FBI agent um, cover could be useful there to just get us access to that person uh, for, for further questioning. Yeah, so I definitely think so. Mm -hmm. All right, so you, uh, I assume you make your way to um, Glenridge, uh, Long Island, and um, any other preparations before uh, the group arrives there? How do you uh, go there by car? Do you have a car, rent a car? With a Uber? Uh, I've got uh, Crown Vic checked out of the mortar pool, and I'm just kind of pushing my luck because I've so far it's not been any issue with the mileage I've put on the car when there wasn't a clear field assignment. So. I think we can all easily fit into that. And it doesn't have the cage partition or anything like that in it. So it's just straight up government car. So um, you make way, your way to um, Glenridge and uh, you arrive there, I assume, um, like in the evening. Um, and driving through uh, the town, you the, the streets are really clean. There's almost no graffiti on the uh, on the walls. Um, the uh, people on the street, if if there are people on the street, they make a well of um, impression of, on you. 
Um, do you go to the police department right away? Do you check in a motel? What's the um, what's the idea? Yeah. And is um, uh, Cass? What's your agent's name? Uh, Agent Madison. Madison. Uh, is she going to um, the museum right away, or do you join them? I think she'd want to try to catch Dr. Wu as Dr. Wu's getting ready to leave work for the day. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel that, you know, as hmm, I guess Agent Martyr would probably insist that we do kind of follow the letter to some degree. And, and the first one thing at least two of us should do is uh, meet with Delbert Coleridge and Sandra Lewis to take over the case. Because we're yeah. going to get a lot of information from them that they've probably, you know, these these murders happened over a series of like a month. Uh, and they probably have already collected some information. Yeah, we want to pull those case files, ME reports, everything that they have already collated for us. So and I think um, Marlo feels strongly that he's a good candidate for the law enforcement interface portion. Yep, I'm a good pe uh, person for the reading reports kind of work. So uh, I get that uh, Agent Medicine is going to the museum and Agent Marlo and Marta are going to the police station and uh i didn't catch that uh, Meyerhofer, hofer are you going to the police department as well yep uh, police department for now then looking at files or talking with the uh, coroner directly so um let's start with um glenridge then let's start with the police department um it's um you know it's a pretty ugly um 70s slightly brutalist building uh, just one story uh, it got a nice new paint job but it cannot hide the inherent ugliness um, under the coat of um, paint um, you you show your badges you um, waved um, uh, uh, into uh, an office where uh, the two agents uh, await you uh, i've got like shit loads of photos, but um, I just describe them to you. So, um, let's see. Um, so, Special Agent uh, Delbert uh, Coleridge is, um, you know, older. He looks like the. Um, have you all seen The Wire? So, he's, um, he's that slim um black guy who is the head of that uh, i can't remember the the um, actor's name so he's he's pretty um slim tall um short cropped uh, hair graying on the temple um very sincere look on his face and um the behavioral analyst um sandra lewis um she is uh, younger blonde she has a, a metal um, glasses and um, you shake hands and um, agent Coleridge says <clears throat> well it's uh, this is a dead end I'm, I'm not sure what you're after you we're chasing a ghost yeah i hear you i think i must have pissed someone off further up the chain i think this might be like a little bit of punishment but hey that happens right every job you just sometimes step on a toe and there's repercussions you just roll with it and well, I'm, I'm gonna do the best i can <clears throat> so um what do you know what do you want to know well honestly everything what do you got i mean uh he looks at um senra uh the person is obviously crazy and she says we don't use that word around here um it, it is probably um male white um i guess um 
he has uh, relationship problems, I would assume. Uh, very meticulous. Um, he seems to have like incredible strength or using a tool. Uh, I would check in with Dr. Santorini to um, um, to get the details, but um, sadists probably um, completely, uh, you know, lack of empathy. Uh, but I, I know I'm not helping. This this is like the just the mass murder uh, classic profile. Classic profile. So what's what's the unusual then? Anything uh, out of the classic profile, out of the ordinary? Uh, you noticed aside from uh, the very uh, big strength. Uh, aside from that, the guy removed the spine. You mean? Yeah, that aside. is weird. <laughs> well, um, how did the the body end up on a um, forty feet electric tower? Why did it place it there? Yeah, in in what way was it placed? Do you have uh, photographies of the uh, of the scenes? Yeah, so um, uh, Delrich. Um, opens the file and there's like all the photos spilling out. Um, and uh, maybe we can cut over to um, agent uh, medicine. So while you're looking at the files and having um, small talk. So um, yeah, you arrive also in the evening at the, the um, Museum for uh, Natural History. Uh, have you been to the museum before? I'm sure she has at some point, at least once or twice. Yeah, I mean, so she lives in the area, and you know, she studied. She went to grad school in the area. She would have had to go there at least on a couple of occasions. Yeah, and so you're not impressed by the gigantic whale that uh, hangs, uh, you know, under the ceiling when you. It's standard. Enter. That's the standard thing. Um, you also do know where the D stacks are. The D stacks is. Um, a collection of unusual items that needs to be um, categorized that they don't really fall into any uh, other category um, and it's in the in the second basement and so uh, the basement levels in the museum uh, they don't have natural light obviously but they also don't have um, like um, electric lights they have this fluorescent um, lines on the on the sides and um the the, the second um basement level especially is like a crazy maze of very very narrow um uh what's it called um paths walkways shelves exactly shelves walkways paths there are um uh dozens of doors and uh, some of them open and you can see that um, um, display cases with um, you know stone um, tablets and scrolls and uh, figurines um, and there's definitely the, the a little bit of a claustrophobic feeling because it's so full of stuff uh, and also because um, the light the lighting is uh, less than ideal, um, and you can ask your uh, ask your way through to uh, Dr. Jensen, um, who is uh, in his office. And if you knock, he um, says with a soft voice, uh, "Come in, please." Jensen, it's uh, been a little while. Um, you look terrible. What happened? You, you're seriously asking me that question? Well, I mean, in addition to, I mean, last time you didn't wear sunglasses. Yeah, well, last time I wasn't here on work. Um, uh, you uh, <clears throat> are you uh, almost done here for the night? You uh, you want to get a drink? Well. We can have a drink here, and he reaches uh, under his desk and um, pulls out um, 
a whiskey bottle and two glasses. I know I'm an enabler. I'm horrible, but hey, I need one as well. Well, don't feel too bad. I uh, pilfered. I'm I'm here with some associates, and I pilfered a bottle of May of Knob Creek that they weren't paying attention to. So I, I brought my own, but you know, <laughs> you get something better. Uh, no, um, no, no, I've I've uh, the uh, the bottom shelf. Uh, Knob Creek, you say. Great taste, but I don't think that you visited me uh, to have small talk about the virtues of different um, whiskey brands. By the way, um, uh, Dr. Jensen is uh, Asian American. He's, um, I think, he's in his 60s. Uh, he has uh, pretty wild hair. Um, reading glasses that rest on his uh on his forehead uh yes he, he has kind eyes but um agent medicine you do know that he has seen some shit so jensen um, i i wish this were just a social call but i uh Kind of here looking into those weird deaths over the last month or so. And I figured that you being you and you having the experience that you do, you might have noticed some stuff that other people would dismiss out of hand because it's just too implausible or too silly or, I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I honestly have no clue. I mean, this is New York. We have crazy murders like every day. Which ones? The ones where the head and spine were removed. Oh, down in uh, in Long Island. Yeah, I heard that. That that sounded weird. Like the the place where they were found and the what? Like who removes the spine? How do you even do that? Well, that is, that is kind of the question, isn't it? Is there Look, you you know that I focused on esoteric studies, shall we say, in my post-grad work. And I remember a few cultures where that was an element of ritual sacrifice, but all of those religions and cults supposedly vanished, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago. So things were, this is a little weird. And I wanted to see if you had heard anything through the grapevine or if you were aware of anything from the media reports that jumped out at you. Because listen, we both know your career is basically going to end in this office. We both know that you're down here for a reason because you asked a few too many of the wrong questions of the wrong people. And this is where they shoved you because they couldn't, you're too useful for them to get rid of, but you're also too weird for them to put out in front of school tours of 12 year olds to ask questions about whales. So I think you underestimate me. I'm also a guardian. There's shit in here that you don't want to see, and if it would, um, if if it would leave the archive, it could uh, cause chaos and mayhem. So, I am the thin blue line between this world and the next. Indeed. So yeah, they kicked me down the stairs into uh, the second floor of the basement but i'm far from useless i'm not saying that you're useless i know you're very useful i'm just saying you know things and i i, I want to know what you know about this so um he um he looks at a um 
like a stack of newspapers um, that probably unread and uh, flips through that. When when were these murders? You say over the last month or so. There were uh, uh, five, somewhere like about half a dozen, maybe a little less so far. I I'm saying so far because I'm not assuming that this is over. I mean, the cops seem to think that it's stopped, but well, Cass takes another drink. We know that these things don't necessarily stop when we think they do. Sometimes they follow you. And on that ominous note, uh, let's go back to the um, police department. Um, so yeah, you, you flip through the files and um, there are the, the photos of the, the bodies. Um, even on the photo, that is a pretty horrific um, um, imagery because it's um, you know the, the whole um, structure of the body disappears if you remove the the the, scal the, the spine obviously so it's um, all the the muscles uh, are uh, ripped open uh, again the head is removed they found only two of the heads uh, one head is still missing. Um, there's also um, um, they check the background of the um, the uh, the victims, obviously, trying to find out any connections. The problem is that Glenridge is so close that there are so many connections that um, yes, they they have the same so social circles. They went to the same um, gym but uh, nothing that stands out. And there's still um, the phone records that haven't been really looked at. Um, they've um, inter tried to interview um, the mother of the, 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 the last victim without uh, a whale. Um, what else is there? Um, that's about it. When did they disappear before their murders? Like, is was there um, a period when they were missing, or did they, did, where they found that before uh, them being missing was noticed? Yeah. So uh, the um, and they assume that the killing um, took place at night, and um, in the last case, it was obviously. It, the assumption is that um, Lauren was probably kidnapped in front of her mother's eye, her eyes, which would explain the, the state she is in. Um, and the other two, they uh, like uh, what we know about um, Vanessa is that she was single. Uh, nobody, um, so she she lived alone at home. Um, and she just uh, went home from the uh, school library, and you know, the next morning they found her in the in the tree. And the first um, the first victim um, went back to um, in the evening. He went back to his um, what's it called, like a praxis? Is that a word? Dental. Yeah. Yeah, practice would be right. Practice, um, because so in the in the morning he had three um, uh, patients, uh, a pretty long um, root canal um, thing that took uh, half of the, the 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 morning, and then in the afternoon he has like uh, his own little um, company that he works off his uh, practice, which supplies um, like dental instruments. Uh, and he worked on that, but um, uh, never came home. Yeah, were there any signs of uh, forced entry into uh, the practice or uh, anything like that? No, the the only signs of a forced entry is for the last victim, for Lauren. So we can see an escalation there. Like the first two could have been uh, crimes of opportunity. And uh, they are placed up higher and higher. Uh, so that, that seems like a 
like or that's just a possible escalation uh could they determine if the scenes uh where the bodies are found are also the scene of the crime or uh, have they been murdered elsewhere and then transported to the place well the um for for like details on the bodies you would probably have to talk to santorini but on the um, you know the documents show that um at least uh what was it it's in the like two of the bodies have show signs of uh trauma connected to falls um and they seem to um, be dropped after the spine was removed yeah where were the heads found uh, two heads were found. Do we know which heads uh, were found, and yeah. uh, where were they in relation to the bodies? Um, so the head of Dr. Moretti was found um, in a, you know, like in a canal. I don't know, let's see, not, uh, near the near the body, but the jaw was missing. And uh, let's see. Were there any marks of predation? I suppose this uh, might be a question for the coroner, but. Uh, so just let me find the, the other head, so to speak. Um, <laughs> That's what we want, you know. <laughs> uh, so the first murder, um, the head was found a small distance from the scene, missing its lower jaw. That's Moretti. Um, the head of uh, Vanessa Hetfan has not been found. And um, the last body, the uh, head was found, I think, uh, under the uh, under the <clears throat> the um, electric tower. So nearby, mm -hmm. relatively. Um, I think I'm going to look to Marlowe and, and then back to the, the agents we're meeting with and say, um, I, I think we have what we need to, to continue the case. Um, we are looking into one lead, and I'll kind of lock eyes with the uh, with my other uh, Delta Green agents here, uh, and say, just kind of say cryptically to the the two agents we're meeting with, did you know that there are half a dozen zoos in the area of New York alone? Um, I, I think we have more than we need to to solve this. Thank you. And, um, you know, both stand up, sigh of relief and say, well, good luck with this pile of shit. And um, they're out. Okay, let's go back to Dr. Jensen uh, and Agent Medicine. Um, so the, the, the bottle is um, uh, a lot uh emptier than before and um um dr jensen has uh or dr wu i guess has um flipped through the the uh, newspaper and said well, this sounds very very odd a ritual killing you think well it seems done ritualistically so, and, and it doesn't match any patterns of human sacrifice in any of the cults that I'm, or civilizations that I'm aware of. I mean, usually they just throw them down a cenote or they cut the heart out or, you know, it's they're, they're, you, they burned them on a funeral pyre. I mean, you're, you're aware of this, you know this, you know the history of human sacrifice and how those sacrifices were carried out. This well, is different, and it, it and it could just be random. It could be a really eerie serial killer who's really just gross. But 
this feels like it's invoking something older. That's why I came to see you, because... It does, actually. I seem to remember, but I can't pinpoint uh, the culture exactly, but I seem to remember that I've uh, read something about uh, a removed spine. Well, I can point you to the part of the library where I think I've read it. Um, it doesn't sound like a, a, a ritualist, like it doesn't sound like a sacrifice. Well, and he uh, stands up and motions you to follow him. And um, he uh, leads you to uh, one of these small rooms and he just makes a, a gesture. Well, South America, I want to say about between 1200 and 1400. AD or BC? Um, AC. After, after crisis, that a thing? Uh, Anno Domini or BC ah, and before Common Era. Yes. All right. So maybe you will find something uh, like with the Con Conquistadores. They um, they've documented some cases. Um, maybe you find something with uh, with later um, cultures because you know. The earlier ones had no written. Um, uh, there's no record of it. Just yeah. there's fossil. There's basically bones and dig sites. Exactly, but you can you can find um, records of them from the conquistadores. Yeah, but the conquistadores destroyed all of the stuff that existed and all of the accounts that existed to date. So and distorted, you know what happened, but. At least it might give you a clue. Jensen, why is it why do the colonizers always have to fuck everything up? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and there's um like a you have the you have the feeling that he has been the he's an older gentleman and he's Asian American. He might have seen he, he might have been the subject of some racial abuse in his time. And he just shrugs and says, well, what can you do? So listen, I appreciate you letting me roam around in here and rummage through your stuff. If I find anything while I'm poking around outside the museum that looks weird, I'm, I'm assuming I can bring it to you. Oh, definitely. I will take care of it. And then, uh, we know, I was never here and we never had this chat, right? Who are you again? Thanks, Jensen. I owe you one. And he leaves. So I think this might be the first role of the evening because you are um, diving into the, the books, I guess. Mm hmm Books. I am assuming that there's glass tables with artifacts. Yeah. All sorts of inter like, you know, obviously and, not primary texts because, you know, this is not a university library, but there's going to be some old stuff in here. Artifacts, uh, maybe some stone tablets. Exactly. Maybe some kind of weird calendar stuff. Yeah, and that's the, you know, they also had this knotted language where where the the number of knots would indicate um, mm -hmm. something. It's not really language, but um, some kind of record. And you can cross reference with um, you know what the conquistadores wrote with the stone tablets and clay uh, shards that you find. Is is this going to require a dark die since there was some implication that all kinds of weird stuff is in here? I would. Um, bet that um, a dark die would definitely help you find the truth. All right. So um, let's, let's go to the um, dice roller and I explain the, the rules of the game. <laughs> yes. Which is, so 
you roll 1d6 for a task that is humanly possible. And I would say it is humanly possible to find information about, you know, what, what are you looking for? Tell me what you're looking for. I am looking for anything... I mean, anything hey, how broad can I be with this? Science would be logical here. You've, Beg you've pardon? Anything to do with heads or spines might be logical to, to look at. Yeah, for. And, and this is why I'm asking how broad it can be, because what I was going to say is anything related to that kind of ritualistic sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, no matter, but, you know, it's like that's kind of broad. So, but it is it one room. Definitely. So uh, you can also like if you have different um, things to look for, then then the cross cross referencing makes it easier. So we know that the um, murderer removed the spine yeah. and the head. What else do you assume about uh, it, or is that it? Um, well, we're assuming that it's pre-Columbian Americas because there's no record of it that we are that we're aware of at this time so that narrows well it, it doesn't narrow it actually kind of expands the field but it, it, it eliminates like you know 500 you know 500 years or so mm -hmm. um we also I, I think at this point can safely say that it is none of the major civilizations so we can rule out the Aztecs, we can rule out the Maya, uh, because that, that just wasn't how what exists of the historical records suggests that they performed human sacrifice. It just doesn't match up with even what the conquistadors said. Mm -hmm. So we can rule all so we can rule that out. Um and then so I mean we've just ruled out two of the pretty much the two biggest societies yeah. in pre-Columbian America. Mm -hmm. We've knocked 500 years off of the search time frame. I mean, so we know we, we're searching basically, you know, before 1500 AD. Yes. So is that is that sufficient? Yeah, that is definitely sufficient. Um, okay. If you now, get one die for so, your, because it's uh, humanly possible, you get another die because of your occupation, because you're an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And then um, it will include somehow um, information that is um, dangerous to the mind, I would say, and that includes the uh, the myth of the die. So you're rolling D and uh, the the red one. So the the three on the left you have to roll. All righty. Do you know how it works? Yeah, I am quite familiar with this. Okay. All right, so I got five and one on the dark die. So you get a four, a one, and a one, which means um, a four is already the maximum information that you can get, so to speak. That is the best result that you can get. And okay. the dark die is not higher, not the highest die, which is also cool for yourself. Um, however, you could um gamble and roll again if you want to to get uh, a five or a six although one could argue that the six is not the best so a five would mean you get the maximum information plus something extra and a six six would mean you get uh the maximum information something extra and more information that you actually ask for all right, do I need to reroll all of the dice including yeah, yeah. the dark die? Yes. Oh, what the heck. Let's have some fun. <laughs> I got a five, a one, and a two. Awesome. Uh, two on the dark die. So, <clears throat> um, what you find out is, um, and it, the uh, the first thing that you find is I think um, uh, a clay um, like a clay maybe an amulet or something and on the amulet you see a, a, a body uh, there's there's a winged creature 
uh, towering over like um, a body and ripping off its head. So that is um, definitely something that could um, um, that could have something to do with your case. Mm -hmm. um, and you can cross-reference it with, um, so first of all, the, the, the shot is from the um, Shavin culture, which is um, uh, a culture about 1200 um, before Christ. BCE, before Common yep. Era. And um, the, the name comes from um, Shavin de Huanta, which was an archaeologist. And um, they, there's probably there's uh, more or less nothing known about them uh, other than um, that they built these huge stone structures and, um, uh, and sculptures. Um, and they died out, um, or not died out, but they were, um, not the, the next culture was uh, the Paracas, uh, 200 before Christ. Um, and actually you have um, read something uh, about the Shavin and um, and it was definitely it has to do with your uh, time in the Amazon. So when you were in the Amazon, you uh, I think you had like a maybe a, a diary from um, from a famous um, archaeologist, and uh, in his diary he um, he told about um, a village that was um, uh, one of the villages of um, an indigenous um, folk uh, that fought the uh, conquistadors and actually um, beat them in, in uh, one of the first encounters. And um, he said that among them there were dark creatures uh, there were dark creatures called the ayapa the silent killer and um they had to burn the whole village down and kill every single um member of the of the village and then the ayapa disappeared well that's certainly interesting um Are there sanity rolls in Cthulhu Dark? <laughs> it's up to you. So you tell me if that um, information shooks you somehow, or, uh, sh sorry, shook you somehow, or if you say, well, I've seen worse. Um, so one thing is you stressed, and then you think that um, this is something unsettling, um, and then you, um, you roll, your dark die, and if it's higher than your, um, uh, than your, let's see. Well, okay. So, so here's what I'm looking at. Yep. You mentioned that this related to her time in the Amazon. That seems like it would be a clear PTSD trigger. Yeah, like, it, it, it is in the actual sense of the word trigger, as it's yeah. PTSD. So, I mean, it seems like this is a good time to make some sort of sanity check or sanity roll. Yeah, and of, the, yeah, yeah it, it makes total sense because it is also tied with it, the reason why you are, um, you know, uh, you are who you are. And so um, if you look at your character sheet, there is um, stress and insight, and it is currently at one. Okay. And what we normally would do is you roll um, uh, your the, the dark die, and it is higher than the one. Uh, and you increase it by one. But uh, so, uh, Justin, would he roll? And if he rolls a one, it wouldn't increase? The only, for a one, the only time it would not increase is if it also rolled a one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you're rolling the dark die by itself, because you have no other die to compare it to. All right, so let me ask this as well. Um, and there's there's a reason why Cass has been drinking pretty steadily through all this. 
alcohol for her acts as a sort of numbing agent to kind of as, as a buffer from shock. So would that offer up die to roll against the dark die? Um, not, I think mechanically not, Justin, would you agree? Okay. I would say no. Okay. But this might be a good time to bring into play your, um, if, if you would like to just resist this dark die roll, uh, your relationship um, with one of your anchors. It just because, just because I mean, I think it'd be more narratively interesting to make the dark die roll mm -hmm. and see what happens with that. Yes. Failure is always more interesting than success. Obviously. All right, so I just roll the dark die. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a one. <laughs> no shit. Jesus. So wow. it tells us something about you, which is obviously alcohol is a hell of a drug. Uh, it does help. Um, but also, I think that there's, um, you know, you got used to the. Um, maybe you just got used to uh, the the memory uh, of that night, or at least it doesn't trigger um, a, like a, a, the trauma every time. Well, that's we've learned something about the culture that may be at work, and we've learned something about ourselves. Awesome. So uh, do you call your colleagues? I mean, I, I would assume, um, let, let's uh, take that back. I would assume that we see her going through these um, documents the whole night, probably, uh, and actually finding the last puzzle of the piece, uh, piece of the puzzle, probably at dawn or something. Would you agree? That I'm totally fine with doing it as a montage and then regrouping yeah. at the motel room in the morning to discuss the research that's been going on at the museum, all the paperwork that um, Meyerhoff has been going through, just to kind of do a not just basically a core dump, and it's like here's all the information we have at this moment. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, so let's go back to um, the other three. What uh, what are your plans for the rest of the the evening slash night? I know. Did we want to try to reach out to Dr. Santorini, or at least make an appointment for tomorrow? Yeah, I think we uh, we need to. There, does the gray substance is still unaccounted for, and uh, we I think we can learn a lot more details from the bodies. Uh. Yeah, I I feel like they're the best lead at this point, just because the other agents. You know, they've basically given us what they have from their interviews and from the crime scene. Um, I, th I think the doctor is going to give us the most new information. Um, can I make a suggestion? Because it's now it's uh, it's evening, uh, and it's unlikely that the uh, Suffolk um, uh, medical examiner is still um, you know in his office. Um, you could use the evening to go through all the, you know, cross-reference all the documents that you have, compare notes, um, and then go maybe together with uh, Agent Madison to the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I dig that. We have, like, you know, a map of the county and then a map of the city up on the wall in the hotel room, plotting out, like, where the bodies were recovered and where the people resided, you know, just trying oh. to collate that sort of stuff and the photos spread out across the beds all that stuff yeah i'm re sorry i'm reading all the accounts from people who have read the scene first and uh, uh looking at all the photos if there's something uh, they missed or uh discounted uh during the investigation by uh either excluding supernatural explanations or just their biases whatever they may be if if there's no objection, maybe we're doing we're going over this stuff while we're being driven around to the various crime scenes uh, mm -hmm. in the vicinity and kind of getting a look on the ground level for ourselves at, at each one. Yeah. yeah, because at night in the rain with the wind and everything, spooky crime scenes. I, I dig that. Montage. I dig that as well. All right, cool. Um, um, it's eight o'clock. 
at least in Amsterdam. Let's make another five, uh, take another five minutes break, and I share the map of the murder scene in the meantime. Yay! Like the oh, not not the murder scene, the the map. Let's see. I'm not sure if you can see that. I will probably how do we do share screen. Oh, that's... Do you see that? No, I don't. Oh, hold on. No? Yep, see it down. Awesome. We'll see you in five.
there are, I'm, I'm back as well. Oh. Um, I think I will share the um, the map in a different way, I guess. Um, I put it in the uh, in the character people on the link. Let's see. Was the gulf on the south of the map, was that like a beach, or was that just where the map ended for the town? Um, so there's the, um, the bay in the north, I guess. No, the, the map does not end. It, uh, it extends a little bit. Let's try it again. It doesn't help that I have the slowest computer in the world, apparently. That's okay. I have about the slowest internet in the world, so. <laughs> ah, I see. And I'm also very old, so the internet and computers and everything, that's a new thing for me. Um, I have a better idea. Hold on. So I, I um, sent you a link to the folder. That makes more sense. This is obviously um, great entertainment for people watching. So here's the um, here's the link to the folder, and it, uh, the name of the image is Map of Glenridge, aptly named. And so, yeah, we wanted to make um, like a small um, montage, I guess. So what was the um, the intention was to visit all the, um, the the sites where the victims were found? Yeah, my thought was we're not like getting out of the car to actually investigate these scenes, but simply getting a lay of the city and of the places of interest for the next morning while we also kind of go over the evidence together um, and then return to our motel for, for the night. Mm hmm Yeah, as, so as we are driving to the city, I would take a uh, looks out of the window to uh, take note of remote uh, high places where you could drop someone, like uh, construction sites or uh, like towers, radio towers, something like that. So, if there's anything uh, of that, I will take note. Mm -hmm. In order to like. Um assume where the killer strikes the next time i guess or uh, where he might or where they where uh, whatever it is might kill the victims so uh we can uh yeah if if it is uh indeed uh, a mundane a mundane uh killer then uh that would be 
they they would need a, a high place to drop their victims and uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I like the idea. So you're you're driving in uh, Agent um, Marlow's car, and um, the rain is uh, pouring down. Indeed, we have the sound of the um, uh, the wipers. Um, Agent uh, Mayhofer is um, you know staring out of the window while um, I guess uh, Agent Martyr is. How do you look at the um, to the documents? Well, where's the light coming from? Oh, I think I think we have like a pen light in the back seat that we that we can just kind of look at them and whenever we stop, all of us can kind of you know just I shove it up into the center console and like point out everything that I think is significant. Uh, I think uh, Agent Martyr, when we first visit um, you know the the more urban crime scenes they're looking for places of entry for like burglars or what have you, like up high, because that seems to be a common theme, right? Um, places where they might be hiding in, in trees or trellises or uh, second story balconies, that kind of stuff. But as we get over to the park scene or scenes and such, I think that there's a shift of like, I, I think I actually asked the other two, have you, have any of you experience with with large cats? More of a dog person, honestly. Uh, no, uh, city slicker too. Look, I've I've dealt with my fair share of serial killers in the past, and uh, I gotta say, not many of them are fond of climbing trees. Yeah, I don't think we would be here if it's, it was just a regular serial killer. We just have to entertain the possibility. And I think you can. Um, so uh, I guess that is uh, an investigation role for uh, Agent Marlow. Uh, and obviously, because you share the, uh, the documents and point out things, um, others could help. Yeah, I think we can use the uh, the the helping mechanism, which is basically just that we all roll dice, essentially. Yeah. And um, would anyone assume that their uh, occupation die uh, comes into play? I guess at least Agent Marlow. I guess. I think Martyr too, probably from. Yeah, uh, you, you were a field agent, Martyr. Yeah, I'm a or, field agent. A I, think I've, I think I've done profiling mm -hmm. people before. Yeah. And uh, Lynette, aka Agent Mayhoff. I don't think this is uh, necessarily my my expertise. I yeah, I, I'm more uh, a dead bodies girl. I mean, there, there's still the um, the photos of the dead bodies. They could, you know, give you some information. I assume. Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, that would be something that's within my expertise. And uh, I'm a medical researcher after all, so I'm pretty good at uh, you know finding information from uh, from uh, yeah texts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So let's get the rolls on the table. We don't have enough uh, dice, I think, but you can add them if you want. I I definitely need a dark die for this, since since oh. I feel like there's going to be some supernatural revelations mm -hmm. here potentially, or some things that don't make sense. Oh, wow.
So I see a lot of fives. Yeah, three fives. Yeah. I still need to roll. I'm, I'm, are my dice the top dice here? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have any experience with this uh, thing. Uh, so what you can do is you just click on the, the, the light blue one. Mm -hmm. And then click the other light blue one, blue one and the red one. And then um, re-roll selected. Okay, I did. I did it, and I uh, I did not. My dark die rolled low, thankfully. Okay, but the highest is a five. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I think the most important information that um, probably Agent Marlow finds out when they when you stop and you go over the documents. Um, you find a correlation between the uh, the first murder and the second one, which is um, well, obviously it has something. To, not obviously, but it must have uh, something to do with the library. Uh, the, the sorry, not the library, the the school, uh, the high school, because both uh, Hetfan and um, Harrogate. Edwin was working at the library at the library at the high school, and Harrogate was a um, was a student there, and um, they found. Uh, what could you find it with the information? Let's see. Um, so you you have the the phone records of all of these um, victims and you find a, uh, one name that pops up um, with Harrogate and Moretti uh, and that is um, Thomas Dengler. Thomas Dengler had a, um, who is a, a student at the um, high school and he had an appointment, well he called or the, the um, the um, uh, Moretti's, sorry, the, the Denglers called uh, the doctor um, and uh, he also called um, Harrogate. Um, and you know that it is Thomas because um, there's also like a list of the ap appointment um, that Moretti had and Thomas had an appointment in the, in the morning of you know, the, the night when he was killed. And I think, um, so a five normally gives you something uh, extra. Um, I think the something extra is probably from uh, Agent Mayhof, and that is um, you uh, have um, pictures from the tree where um, the, the body of the librarian was found and the tree had no signs of somebody climbing up. So um, you assume that uh, the body was dropped from above, either from a helicopter. Yeah. yeah. Um, had, do we have records of uh, tire tracks near the scenes? Um, at least not. Uh, the same. Okay, yeah, because one theory, if we want to have a uh, keep with mundane explanations, uh, it would be like uh, something with leather on it, like a you know a fire truck or something for cutting trees or painting uh, house fronts, uh, something like that that could be uh, yeah erected and then uh, people thrown off. You can, yeah, you can rule that out. Okay. It's is that Meyerhoff's feeling, or do, does their mind wander to more out there explanations? Um, he, she starts with uh, with this, and then, uh, of course, it's uh, it. Yeah, uh, I can't say for certain yet that the evidence supports a supernatural explanation, but uh, uh, 
I don't think uh, we have a uh, helicopter riding right. steering killer on our hands. Um, yeah, does that bother you? I, I think I've joined Delta Green for a reason. So uh, that there is that there are supernatural things is not what bothered me. Uh, it's more of an intriguing field of study at the moment, but it might start buzzering me once uh, it gets clearer what actually is going on. See, and I think the supernatural, at a very low human level, just offends Marlowe, especially now that he's got a child on the way and knowing that they're even worse than people, there's other stuff out there really bothersome so i might need to roll uh, and it's probably more anger than uh you know horror yes it's yeah like moral outrage that this even exists i, I think that i might also need to roll a dark die because I, I feel like a lot of my even with delta green a lot of my investigations have resulted in catching a a human suspect so so the concept that this might be something more out there it is shocking. Mm -hmm. and which I got a wand. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, oh, wait. Oh, OK. Pocket got a one as well. Maybe the I, dice one. I got a six, so. OK, so it works. Um, yeah, I think so we have these. Um, this montage scene also with agent medicine interspersed. I think there was a mentioning of big cats. Uh, I don't know who, I think uh, agent Marlow said it. So I think there was a, a, a um, uh, agent Marty. Uh, so yeah. there was probably a, a small scene of um, the horrible incident in the Amazon. Um, but we also see, uh, obviously, uh, Agent Medicine um, like reading through um, texts, comparing um, these uh, clay amulets and shards and everything uh, until the morning uh, dawns. And um, I think, um, shall we just assume that you all meet up in the motel? in the morning probably um i don't know how does uh, agent medicine look like after that night i actually have a better suggestion okay. not, a, not a better suggestion a different suggestion uh, i wonder if the real our our conversations last night indicating that this might be a supernatural creature of some kind necessitate that we return to the green box <laughs> to meet up uh just so that we can just just as like a meeting place since um, mm -hmm. yeah that works for me mm -hmm. yep good um, here so, <clears throat> i think at um like about so when would you go to the uh you call each other up to to meet up at the green box at uh at what time do you leave glenridge what do you think well, remember, uh, Madison was in the live was in the stacks yeah. until just before dawn. Yeah, so for you, it's not even that long of a trip to New Jersey, I guess, over the bridge. Um, and the others? Well, it sounds like you might not be sleeping because I I definitely suggest like early morning, you know, yeah. six, six or seven a.m. Yep, Marlowe's an early riser, anyways. So. Yeah, and so it's this um, eerie light, um, especially, uh, you know, in autumn, the, the, the early morning is just like night. There's no difference. Um, there's there's my, maybe a hint of um, dawn on the horizon, um, but you still have these uh, very bright lights, um, the dark, the, the darkness of the, um, the space in between. And uh, yeah, you're in the... Um, in the green box, what do you do? I put the bottle of Knob Creek back on the table. Say, you might need some of this. And you probably and, uh, want to take a seat. Is, is medicine um, like visibly shaken or drunk or something? 
I, I think she always has something. Well, I shouldn't say always. She, when she's on a mission, considering that she's not a tactical operative, she often has at least a low grade buzz going. She should not drive a car, but that does not necessarily mean that she's sloppy or falling over. Um, and yeah, basically it's to kind of cope because she's going back into the environment that she was in when the worst thing that ever happened to her happened. Uh, and the others, I mean, nobody, um, well, actually, uh, uh, let's see, Martia, were you shook by the revelation a little bit? Did, is that visibly visible? Uh, it, it, it is. Um, I, I think that the way she shows it, though, is by becoming very silent and very serious. And like she really wants to hear uh, what what our fourth agent here has to say, um, and, and I, knowing what it is as a player, I think thematically that's it's really appropriate that they reveal this to us <laughs> right now. So yeah. So I talked to an old colleague of mine over at the library, and. He's dealt with unusual things. And I can get I can get deep into it. I can talk about the cultures and whatnot if you're interested, but the upshot of it is that there were two records of plea of pre-Columbian civilizations that had non-human entities depicted in their art and artifacts, and that in one case, the most recent case, that conquistadors were defeated by non-human and non-animal entities, which had to be, well, they had to burn down the entire village to finally defeat it. So they killed literally every single person in the village with fire, burned it to ash, and basically just covered everything up. Sounds like Conquistadors, all right. Yeah, it does. But in this case, they, I mean, they may actually have been on the right track. I mean, the, the, as opposed to doing it for fun, this sounds like they actually had a need to do it. So, but there's no record of these civilizations ever since, but the, the record of them in the artifacts is that they actually did remove heads and spines. So that's that's hopeful. Madison oh. takes a drink. Uh, I will also take a drink. And and this is for those serve who have served with me on other missions, this is uncharacteristic. Marlo so, reaches yeah. into the donut bag and pulls out a jelly, shaking his head. You got a spare in there? Got a like yeah, maybe like I, just a blade I hand or an old fashioned? Over, pass it around. Yeah, that's mixed bag. All right. So, uh, I mean, the good news is, I can't believe I actually said that there's good news. Um, if we run into anything really, really weird, we can reach out to uh, my contact over there. Good dude. Um, you know, he's one of the few people in the field who will actually talk to me because he doesn't think I cracked up in the jungle. And so, uh, worst comes to worst, he, he may have some ideas that could help us out once we get a better idea of what we may actually be facing. But it's not human and it's no known species of animal. So. But we know that it's susceptible to fire, but of course we can't burn down Glenridge. Well, it's legend has it 
that is susceptible to fire. Remember, the conquistadors basically destroyed every single written record they they came across to annihilate the cultures. They wanted to replace everything. So all we really know is what they said. That's not necessarily what actually happened or what actually works. Yeah, the, so, cor the correlation might actually be the people uh, vanishing uh, and not the methods uh, by which they were uh, exterminated. Agent Mayov, can you make a dark die roll? Of course I can. Give me a second to find the right window. And uh, it's a five. So <clears throat> it dawns to you that. Um, you must have uh, maybe talked to uh, another member. You know, you have been in another cell probably. Um, and they said that one day um, they had to um, kill a priest that was uh, conjuring some kind of um, a creature. And you realize that what you just said is true, but it's also horrifying because the way to kill the creature is probably not to kill the creature but to kill the priest yeah uh, that's a realization I had uh, I um, I put the donut I uh, taken a bite out uh, down on the uh, on the table again uh, suddenly not really in the mood for for uh, sweets anymore, and uh, yeah, let's uh, so let's continue get, uh, sorting through the information. Uh, so does that mean we have to kill the host with fire? Is this like some sort of possession? Let's not rush to conclusions here. We have we we should still investigate this as we should with any case. So. We have a couple of leads that are still open. We have the mother uh, and uh, probably the only witness to whatever happened. So I think we can gain valuable information there. Then we fi figured out uh, yesterday night that uh, the local high school might be uh, a center of activities. And there was a young man uh, who uh, had contact with at least two of the victims. and. Uh, Maybe we can find out which school the third victim attended, so we uh, know if he uh, was in contact with uh, all three of them, or a possible point of contact. Uh, that is something we can follow up, as well as the physical evidence of gray matter and uh, the medical records uh, located at the coroner's office. So that's, those are the three leads I'm uh, seeing at the moment, uh, unless someone wants to go on an expedition to find out vo where whatever uh, being uh, could be nesting or resting if indeed it has a physical resting place. Well, this I'll volunteer to go talk to the mother Sorry. because, well, I, I mean, I I know something like what she's been through, and maybe. Maybe maybe that'll be enough to get her to talk a little bit. Uh, fair point. Uh, do you think you are like? Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, people in our line of business uh, um, are under a lot of stress. So, just honest question: Do you think you can handle whatever she tells you? and come back and relay that information to us. Well, I've made it back from everything so far. Good enough for me. I'll go with him. Oh, I'm sorry, her. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've interviewed people before. And uh, I can keep an eye on you. I can well, take a and, break if, if, it, if it gets too intense. And if I completely crack up, you can at least maintain the record. 
So, Roger. You know that's that's promising. That's hopeful. Well, Meyerhoff, do you want to visit the Emmy Santorini? And that's what, I'll, yeah. And I'll pull, uh, see if there's any uh, police records on this Thomas Dangler, since he's a person of interest at this point. May I offer some guidance? Yes. This Thomas Dangler, if he does seem to be suspicious i would suggest you not tip him off yeah you know this it. is non-interactive at this point this is just background information because i'll just go to the police and just say you know i want to pull any information if there's anything with dangler having been in the court system foster homes any of that sort of stuff where he lives, just so we get our information lined up. You know, you might want to pull some additional files besides his. So if anybody goes looking for strings, they've got to tug on a few more. Make them look like they've been gone through, that you looked them up. Yeah, I'll pull like five other high school student files from whatever school Dangler's at and some of the other teachers there. Yeah, just... You know, yeah. give people a little, you know, give yourself a little bit of a smoke screen there. Yep. And find out if the third victim attended the school while you're at it. Roger that, have, Myra. Have we, this is a weird question, but have we done a map of where the killings occurred and like drawn it out? I mean, I know in the past people have tried to do killings in in way like in location in specific locations. Yeah, we we have we drove around uh, the town yesterday, and uh, if I, we made some notes on our map, and uh, if I'm seeing this correctly, uh, all bodies were found on the edge of town, like none were found within the city limits, but uh, close to it. Um, I, we can't be sure exactly about their points of uh, disappearance, but the killings uh, yeah, seem to uh, happen outside of town. Any specific distance between the bodies? Any kind of, I mean, is it like, drawing a circle around the town or something or is it moving in that general direction or uh, like it could be like a half circle like they are they are about evenly spaced uh, from each other and uh... Lauren's body was found the largest the furthest distance from the others but she was a student at the high school I think that's what's important I just I just want to make sure we're not dealing with something that's trying to open like a portal to hell or something ridiculous like that. So I just, I have weird ideas sometimes. Marlo lays out the map where we annotated where the information was and just like <clears throat> looks around for something with a straight edge and just takes a pencil and lightly draws lines uh, so that it doesn't really obscure anything. And I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm not seeing an obvious pattern using straight lines, but I don't know that a straight line is the right way to connect anything here. I mean, I don't really do the hoodoo. Yeah. I mean, as the crow flies, all of these places are just a hop and a skip away. All right. I just want to make sure we don't have somebody drawing sigils or something like that using corpses. That's... All right, let's let's. I need another drink. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I think the the next um, place you go is probably um, the psychiatric institute. And so, um, Martia, Agent Martia, and uh, Agent Medicine. Um, you drive to um, uh, to Swansea, which is uh, a little bit outside. Uh, you know, you have to um, 
go back to New York and cross the bridge. Um, and it takes you um, a couple of hours, I think. How does the, the I would assume that um, Agent uh, Marta is driving. Yes. Uh, and you probably had your private car parked at the uh, facility, I would assume. Uh, and so how does the is that is the drive like in an awkward silence um do you talk to each other what do we see in the uh in the montage uh i think there's a little conversation i i, I think um halfway through the drive i turn to you and i just kind of ask casually uh you know this one isn't too close to home, is it? You know, I can't tell if it is or not because some days everything feels too close to home and some days nothing ever feels like home at all. Do you, you know what I mean? Like, it's just... Some days everything's overwhelming, and other days it feels okay. So I don't quite know which this is going to be yet. And I'm hoping it's one of those days where everything seems to be okay. Because I'm going to try to make a woman live through one of the worst moments of her life by basically reliving pretty much the worst moment of mine. So I'm not real optimistic about that. So it's, it's, it's nice to have some backup. It's nice to have somebody who can kind of just who, who can jot down any information that comes up if anything comes up just just in case you know it's agent martyr it, will will nod um but she's she's you know, having having worked with you before, I think that she's a little concerned about you telling her that you're going to reveal what happened to you in the, in the jungles of South America. She's not re she's not so sure she's ready to hear to hear that. And I will flip on the radio. So <clears throat> you arrive at um, the clinic. It's um... It's an old building probably from the end of the uh, 19th century red brick, brick uh, building, but it has a, a modern annex. Um, and um, again, you show your badges, you are led to, um, to uh, the floor at least where um, Ms. Harrogate is in a, in a private room. Um, before the door, there is a, a nurse, and um, she's a, an older woman, and she looks very concerned. And she says, uh, I'm not sure what your credentials are or what your expertise in this case, but um, Mrs. Harrogate is heavily traumatized, and every kind of um, extreme, uh, you know, um, extreme outside influence can um, really hurt her um, situation. She's, she's catatonic, she doesn't speak, um, except um, once in a while she, she starts to scream and it is really um, heartbreaking to see that. So I, I hope you have good reasons to do that. Is she sedated? Um, she is. Well, as you know, uh, your patient was potentially the witness to a murder. 
Oh. Now, I have interviewed many people in my time, and I understand that I, I don't want any harm to come to her. I, I will I will use my best judgment. Um, I think that is a role to persuade her. She's, she's like a wall, and she's tried to protect her patient. Um, and I think it would be interesting if you fail, because what, what are you willing to do? Um, so I'm rolling the failure die. Excellent. I, as for me, I think the human die and my professional die come into play here. And honestly, I think this is a stressful situation, so I'm gonna I'm gonna roll the dark die for that as well. So I have a what did I have? A four, I think. Yeah. Oh wow, <laughs> that was <laughs> okay. Do you want to re-roll? Um, I, I was going to ask, can I roll? Yes, you can help. Uh, how will you help? Um, well, so I, I don't know if this necessarily applies given the mechanics, but because I have, I've basically been in the same situation as the patient. Would that allow me to roll two dice? Yeah, I, I think. Kind of an yeah, it's your background. It's not necessarily your occupation, but yeah, okay. I think your, your background definitely applies. And I think the dark die absolutely applies because this is trauma. Mm -hmm. I got a six and a four on the dark die. Excellent. So, yeah. So the stress level goes up, or would it only go up if the uh, dark die is highest? It's not the highest, so technically no. But yeah. of course, on a six, we might learn something that would result in its own dark die roll, potentially. <laughs> that is true. Um, so All right. what do you say to the nurse? How do you persuade her? What do you give up or you know, what do you tell her? Probably better than anyone here and anyone else in law enforcement. I understand what that woman has gone through because I have been there and I have seen something similar happen when I was not able to prevent it. Now, you can see my credentials. You can see that I have FBI credentials right here. I am here specifically to speak to this woman because quite frankly, I am one of the only people on the planet who has seen anything close to the violence that she has seen. I struggle with it every single day, but we need to catch the killer before they kill again. So you can move out of the way and let me do my job, or I can start making some phone calls and you will find yourself being audited every single year for the rest of your life you'll find police following you home and writing you tickets for taillights that were broken that weren't when the stop initiated i don't want to make your life difficult and i don't want to hurt her but i do want to stop a killer a killer and i will visit wrath upon anyone who gets in my way um, I have a suggestion for the six here, if it's okay. Uh, I think I have to play good cop here. And I maybe take the nurse away for a moment to talk through the situation. And this is your chance to interview alone. <laughs> Which, of yeah. course, can't go badly at all. <laughs> so I think um, what you see, like, the, the six is probably um, she obviously caves in. She you see um, a look in her face that is uh, just utter horror, and it's not the horror that she's afraid of um, the police harassing her. It is that she's afraid of you. That she's afraid of what somebody is willing to threaten somebody else, and how you know the shit you have to. Um, have been gone through in order to develop that personality to act in the way. 
So I don't know if that stresses you out that people are starting to be afraid of you, um, but she definitely is. It, it stresses me out, so I'm going <laughs> to roll the die. I was, I was going to say, it's like, I've already been shunned from my profession that I worked toward for decades. I mean, what do I really care about a nurse being a little spooked? No. I mean, it shows us that you don't if you don't roll. Yeah. I, I honestly don't think at this point that Madison cares. So um, you enter the room, and the first thing that you realize is that um, the room is like completely overheated. Um, somebody have cranked up the heat, and it is like it's this stale, um, hot uh, air. Um, the um, the patient sits in a um, comfortable chair with her back to the um, to the window. And what is also uh, weird is that there are at least five or six lamps on every surface. There are two standing lamps. Uh, there are table lamps, and they are all switched on. Um, and she uh, just stares, um, you know, with a with the light from the uh, window in her back, stares uh, empty in the room with empty eyes. Oh, and there's a like, uh, I'm sorry. There's uh, on the table, and um, there are um, these um, what do you call them? Letter cubes, maybe. Do you know what I mean? Um, not offhand. I, I missed the second word you said. Or I missed the word you said after letter. Like uh, alphabet cube. blocks? Yeah, alphabet blocks. That's the word I was looking for. Interesting. So you can assume so, that they tried to communicate uh, with her uh, through the blocks, but apparently... The chair, is a, the chair's back is to the window, or the chair's back yeah. is to a wall? Uh, no, it's like back with, to, she sits with her back to the window. Interesting. What does the room smell like? Well, it is um, the the smell of a hospital, which which is this antiseptic smell. Yeah. That he, um, but it's also the um, like an old person smell, uh, amplified by the the heating, like stale sweat from the heat and everything yeah. from the lamps. And interesting. I reach into my go bag and I pull out a cassette recorder, put a blank tape in, start recording. So how are you doing today? She doesn't even blink. You know, I know what happened to your daughter. I was in the Amazon and I saw something very similar happen to most of the people on an archaeological dig I was on. There are only a couple of survivors and they're a lot like you. They don't talk about it. They just sit and stare. They don't speak. But I want to find what killed your daughter. Because it, or something like it, killed a lot of people that I was close to and ruined my profession. And I want to make you a promise. You help me find it. I'll fucking kill it. So that it can't hurt anybody else ever again. Well, make her a roll. Let's see if she's responsive. All right. So, humanly possible background and dark die? I'm not sure if it's humanly possible. Um, well, the humanly possible is the die that you always get. I, I mean, I see the, um, the background, the shared trauma, and I definitely see the dark die. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I, what I want to say is that if somebody else would try it, they wouldn't succeed. 
there's there's definitely precedent for not rolling the human die. I mean, th in most cases, it has to do with supernatural stuff, but uh, in in some cases, you can also say like normally you wouldn't be able to do this if you weren't the protagonist <laughs> or whatever of the story. Mm -hmm. So how many dice am I rolling here? Uh, one normal die and one dark. All right. <laughs> Five and six on the dark die. Oh, wow. I think, um, I think when you say um, something about a creature, um, she suddenly, like, she was staring at the ground the whole time, like, not blinking, just staring, sitting there, um, completely unresponsive. And then you mentioned the creature in the in the jungle, and then all of a sudden she she jerks her head jerks up and she looks you straight in the eye, um, and she says she says something in uh, Latin actually, and she says in Latin. Which I don't speak. Um, the black angel came. As an archaeologist, is it reasonable that I would understand what she just said? Yeah, definitely. All right, so are we resolving the dice roll before we continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so what, is, the, so what does my fantastic dark die roll get me? What does what does that do? So, um, what it does is it um, gives you um, insight into what's actually happening, mm -hmm. uh, and it also ties it back to your. Uh, it can tie back to your um, personal experience. So, um, I think when you um heard the the phrase the black angel came you definitely um remember flipping through the um uh, the, ar the archive at the museum and seeing yeah, yeah. The museum. and um i mean you were flipping through records but you were also looking at um at artifacts and you do remember um pretty yeah, yeah, um, uh, the Ayapa, definitely. <clears throat> and um, you remember uh, like a, a phrase that has the same um, wording, uh, the black uh, angel, and it was uh, in relation to a human sacrifice. So it was, um, and it, def it is definitely a part of the um, museum that is completely closed normally, that only uh, Dr. Um, Wu can access. And it, um, to you, it made the impression as if it were a spell, a binding spell. And the binding spell was called Summoning Winged Steed. And um, it is a spell that you have to learn and that if you want to um, perform it, uh, you would have to um, sacrifice uh, a human being, but that would um, summon and or ban um, the Ayapa. And I think that realization is obviously uh, pretty uh, bleak. Charming. Oh, so. Oh, and so what I'm sorry, the last mechanical thing is your um, yeah. stress goes up, but your insight into um, you know, the mythos knowledge goes up as well. All right, so that goes up to two and two, correct? Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, shall we cut? Uh, oh, and then um, she starts screaming. And we cut over to um, to uh, Marty, Agent Marty, talking to the nurse, and the whole scenery, like you're standing on the floor, and you know there are these patients walking by, and for you, it, it looks as if 
you know, they, they, they walk stiffly sedated, almost like marionettes. Um, you're talking to the nurse and what do you say? Uh, I suppose, I suppose I say that, um, uh, look, it's, it's not as bad as my partner made it out to be, uh, you know, she's just very protective of, of the case, but, but also, you know, there's, there's victims here and, uh, we need to solve this case so that more people like her, and I kind of nod over to the door, uh, over to the room, uh, don't don't suffer the way she did, or, well, honestly, either of them have, if you know what I mean. And I'm gonna give, give her a knowing look. And that is when uh, there's this, uh, like, incredible hysteric screaming from the room coming. And on that charming note, uh, let's take our last break. Five minutes. Yep.
Um, concerning time, we have half an hour. Uh, would it be possible to play a bit longer? Sure. To, to My schedule's open. Justin? Yeah, my schedule is open for a bit longer. If we could just check in at the next break, that would be good. Yep, I'm good. Yeah, it would be cool to have uh, maybe home scenes at the end. I'm enjoying all of the slow realizations that are leading to like tense, tense internal thoughts and, and, and conversations here. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying myself a lot. Yeah, it's been really good. I like how it's playing out, especially the. It, it's it feels like a rules light dice light version of Delta Green, and I like that. I mean, I, I don't mind die rolls for things like sanity mechanics in a situation like this. That's part of it. But but I like the way that, it's, that it de-emphasizes, you know, rolling dice. Mm -hmm. I like that it focuses on story. Yeah. Um, Jasmine, do you have, um, like, maybe another half an hour? Are you... Sure thing. Oh, cool. Awesome. So um, let's cut back to Agent Mayhof and uh, Agent Marlow. Uh, Agent Marlow was checking the, um, the police records. Yes, that's correct. I wanted to pull background information. And so I'm pulling what I can on Thomas Dangler, but there'll be like the third or fourth person out of like maybe eight. Yeah. It's a mix of students and teachers from that high school. Yeah, so there's no criminal record of uh, Thomas Dengler. And nothing about having been in foster systems or anything like that? No. Um, Dean's list? <laughs> no. Or, okay. All right, so he seems to be an ordinary kid. Yeah. It's 898. Or wait, 95. Oh, no Facebook to go check. Uh, you're muted. I'll check and see if uh, <clears throat> there's any chance he has like a GeoCities page or anything like that. He does a GeoCities page. I haven't heard that word for a long, long time. Um, so yeah, he um, he has a page where he um, writes about um, mostly about uh, which is weird. I mean, he, he writes about um, his favorite music is uh, The Cure. Um, but um, on the dates, you can see that uh, recently he has been into Peruvian archaeology, which is not normal for a 16-year-old. And um, so he um, talks a lot about his um, grandfather and how revolutionary he was and that he's um, um, he shares um, photos of uh, him going to um, museums. Um, that's Thomas Dengler, The Cure, and um, and other like um, gothic type uh, music. Yep. Yeah, I totally know the type. Yeah, Sisters of Mercy. Uh, Fields of the Nephilim. <laughs> so I make notes and um, and is the name of uh, Thomas's grandfather uh, listed um, yeah. anywhere there? Yes, it, uh, his grandfather is called. Uh, Derek Wheeler. Okay, so from mother's side of the family. Yeah. Hmm. 
All right. Um, then, then I'll just take that information and share that with Meyerhoff. I'm like, maybe as we're driving over to Santorini, mm -hmm. I'm like, so this Thomas kid definitely is a person of interest. He has this GeoCities page and okay, so he's into the cure and goth stuff. Get that. Very teen emo. But get this. He had photos of him and his grandfather going to museums and stuff. And he talks about being into Peruvian archaeology. That's odd. Yeah. I'm not sure where that fits in, but I think maybe Madison can give us some insight into if that is a significant linkage. Oh, um, Agent Malo, your phone rings. Uh, answer. Marlo here. Oh, wait, is it the burner phone or my regular phone? The burner phone. Okay. Yeah. So Marlo here. Yeah, you, you hear um, like uh, three or four seconds of uncomfortable silence. Uh, somebody's sucking on a cigarette. So, what's the status? Mark is here. We are starting to pull together some pieces that look like they support some linkage. We're just on our way to talk to the ME right now. Uh, but we got some good intel last night, and I know that uh, Martyr and Madison were interviewing the parent of the uh, high school victim, uh, Harrogate, and we're hoping they'll have uh, some additional information. And we have a person of interest. Um, I don't know if you want that over this line or not, or if you just want it's us to keep line. that on the download. Secure line, then. All right. So there's this high school student, Thomas Dangler, and he has some connections uh, based on interactions, phone calls, appointments with the victims. And then out on his Chio Cities page, see that he's into Peruvian archaeology. He actually talks about it a fair amount out there, almost as much as he talks about some bands. And he uh, has some photos of him with his grandfather, uh, a Derek Weaver. So we want to see next, after we talk with the ME, get some information on that Derek Weaver. Because if this kid has some sort of in line to, I don't know, some sort of unnatural type resource, whatever we want to call it. Where the heck did he get it from? And how does he use it? So that gray substance, um, the results came back. Apparently it's a, it's a polymer. And um, the interesting bit is that it is not a, um, a known uh, polymer. It shows signs of um, you have you have. I mean, I'm not a chemist, obviously, um, but <clears throat> you have um, more like a um, chaotic formation of polymers, and you have. Um, extremely um what's it called like uh extremely um what's the word i'm looking for ordered ordered um polymers and these uh these gray substance shows both sign uh, both signs um and he uh pauses for a second uh and marlo's oh. like i i don't have a clue what you're talking about hold on a second and he passes the phone over to meyerhoff going i don't know chemistry talk can you interpret 
Yeah, so the, the gist of it is that <clears throat> it is not a known polymer uh, from this earth and that it um, seems to um, be uh, adaptive to its surrounding. And then he says, uh, can I get uh, Marlowe back? And that's for my hold. I take and the phone back. All right. So hopefully Meyerhoff understood that. Sure. Um, how's uh, Agent Medicine doing? Whiskey and donuts. Everything's fine. Five by five. Well, you know the drill. Sometimes somebody has to fall into their salt. The cover is blown, you cut medicine. Roger that. Click. Okay, so you drive to Santorini, um, to the um, Suffolk. Looks like we got you cut out there. This is a building um, built probably like three or four years ago. Um, and um, uh, he is obviously in the in the morgue um, eating some kind of um, horrible hot dog or something. And um, he leads you to the, um, you know, to the mock, and he says, "Chewing." You sure you want to see this? Yes, that's why we came here. <laughs> um, so he opens the first, um, what's it called, the drawer, and um, it is unpleasant. And still chewing, he says. Um, so this is uh, what's left of Carl uh, Moretti. Uh, all the major uh, muscle groups in his back, and he points um, half with a hot dog, half with a finger. And neck uh, are severed, uh, all ribs and hip bones uh, shattered. As you can see, the head is gone. Um, Still haven't uh, heard anything about the substance under his nails, but if you look at this, and he points at uh, the hips, and there are some um, uh, hypothermal, is that a word? Hypothermal, hypothermal wounds um, that are not conclusive. It, he must be in contact with some kind of um, very cold um, surface. Hmm. That's interesting do we do you have any uh ideas or uh, signs what uh, the weapon uh, or the murder might have been um the closest i can come up with is uh, like a, a tree cutter it is at the same time like a, a strong force but uh, but not really um, sharp more blunt and cutting Interesting. So, would you, from your uh, analysis of the scenes, uh, uh, suggest that uh, they were killed at the scene or someplace else? Was there enough blood at the scene? Uh, no, uh, I think it has been. Um, he has been killed somebody at somewhere else. Cool. Um, do we have a timeline of? Uh, of the uh, wounds, uh, did he, per, which of those were uh, pre-mortem, which of those were post-mortem, and uh, yeah, how long did uh, did the whole crime last? Uh, by your best estimate, mm, difficult to say. So the um, the uh, traumatic wounds that indicate um, fall from uh, from height uh, was post-mortem. Um, I don't think that the uh, 
that the uh, killer took uh, their time with a with the body. It it must have been pretty quickly. Um, so, do you have any any indication uh, what heights the the victims fell from? Um, substantial. Uh, I, I want to say. Um, let's see. Yeah, substantial height. Difficult to say. Um, uh, same height for all of the victims. Uh, more or less. So are we talking hundreds of feet or a thousand feet here, Doc? Uh, no, uh, uh, it's say um, fifty feet. And then uh, he goes over to the next um, drawer, opens it. Pretty much the um, the same state as you can see. Um, same substance on the fingernails. We still haven't. Uh, had any uh, news on that uh, we couldn't find uh, the head on from that one and then he goes to the next uh, drawer um, and yeah as you can see sack of meat it's all of what's left of her Well, this is completely fucked up. I'm going outside to get some fresh air. Yeah, can't blame you. So the substance was under all the nails? Yes. Uh, any other defensive wounds or signs of, uh, of, um, of them putting up a fight? Well, these thermal uh, wounds or... Um... You know, points again at hips and arms. That could be where the, I don't know, where the killer grabbed them, um, wearing some kind of, I don't know, dry ice gloves, I guess. <laughs> so that's your theory of the case, dry ice gloves? Um, look. I, I don't have any theory. I mean, obviously a mad person and a mad person with a helicopter. Uh, I would think a letter is uh, way more likely than a helicopter at uh, 50 feet. But that would also uh, correlate with the, uh, with the tree cutter uh, if we uh, think that is uh, a likely about a weapon so we we have you gave us some valuable information to follow uh yeah uh, was there any other substance uh coating the body anything that uh might account for the scene of the actual crime uh, oh hold on uh, come with me and he goes to his office um takes something out of the safe and um hands it over I still have some of the, the gray substance. That's uh, everything we found. Okay, so no, uh, uh, no, no um, earth on the clothes or sand or anything like that. Fibers. Uh, nothing that is not um, you know conclusive with the, the area where it was found. Uh, what was the state of that clothes? Uh, was it removed before? Um, removing the spines and heads or what was no, that? The, the the clothes were was teared um in the same way it would have been when uh, the killer just removed the spine with extreme force okay and and now conclude conclusions about what it was teared with there i I'm at loss. I mean, I haven't seen that in my career of uh, 35 years. Yep, it's quite unusual. I uh, uh, haven't seen one like this either. But yeah, I'm sure that we will find out uh, what whoever was uh, behind this. And thank you for your assistance and keep yourself available should uh, 
other que- further questions arise, I I will go to my colleague and uh, make sure he uh, he's all right. Yeah, he hands you his uh, his card with a phone number. All right. Um, so you reconvene, I guess, all of you. Uh, where do you meet up? At the motel that you haven't visited yet? Green box, I guess. <laughs> there. Green box. Yeah, I think the green box is a good place for these types of sensitive discussions that we yeah. want someone to accidentally overhear. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, you meet up, I, I would say at noon probably. You're all pretty tired. None of you have slept in a while. I want to say that um, medicine on your way back, because uh, Agent um, Agent Martyr is driving, I guess. Um, you fall asleep. And um, what do you like normally dream of? Do you dream of your um, the incident in the jungle often? My dreams are... I don't get restful sleep. Ever. It's not uncommon for me to wake up screaming. So, it's, this time, I, I remember fragments, and none of it's good. Yeah, I think this time it's a different scenery. Um, you dream that you are um, near like a gigantic and obviously uh, fresh uh, impact crater. And uh, on the rim of the impact crater is an improbably tall um, pyramid. And you cannot see, make out what's, what's going on there. But you do see that the, the stones that the pyramid is made from um, are so gigantic, that gigantic blocks, um, like a step pyramid, that you cannot fathom how any uh, ancient uh, civilization could have moved them. It it definitely dwarfs the you know uh, pyramids in Egypt, and you know that's part of your dream at least. Um, so do we meet up at the green box? Seems like the place. And you, yeah. yeah. You I'm uh, on on the way. I'm taking some healthy food. So get some electrolytes into the, these people. We can't uh, run an investigation on donuts and whiskey alone. So you you buy them lies, but okay. <laughs> it works for at least a week, honestly. So, so you have me pull over to market so we can get some bananas and apples. Yep. Kale. And, uh, yeah. Uh, some. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, some some uh, water or no sports drink stuff. Um. Yeah, in front of the or inside of the um, storage garage. Um. What do you say? Meyerhof, uh, Meyerhof is obviously handing out um, apples and water. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, so you want to hear the details of the uh, of the uh, medical side before or after we eat? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask if it's necessary or if we know who's doing the killing. Because I have a spell for binding. And if we know who's doing it, the medical information is irrelevant because we know who's doing it and we know how to stop them. You have a what now? Spell of binding. You it see my will... hand kind of slide down to my hip and rest on my service weapon. I'm like, are you okay? You're talking about having spells here? Where'd you get a spell? Uh, 
it don't say it's complicated don't say that I, I i would never say that i would just say it's hard to explain but it's information that i retrieved from god what was that poor woman's name harrogate um, i'm gonna say like i interrupt and i say wait what did, what did you and sandra talk about in there listen if you want to know what happened later, there's a tape recorder in my bag. I recorded it. But I'm actually, it, I think I insist. I, I actually, with that, I'm going to say maybe that's something you should leave here. And I and I look around to the yeah. for supplies to to wrap up and and document the tape recorder here in the green box. So it's a spell of binding. She mentioned in Latin, which isn't a language that I was aware that she knew that hasn't come up in anything, the black angel. That fits with everything that I've learned from the museum and Jensen, Dr. Wu, as you guys know him. And so I know what spell we need and I need at least one other person to learn it just in case. And Not yet. Matter, martyr, I think that's you. I think you are the one with the most experience in weird stuff like this. Um, I look up yeah. from marking a plastic baggie with a Sharpie, and it just has written on it, Black Angel Tape. <laughs> and I have a uh, those electrolytes were a good idea. I yeah. I needed that. Thank you. But uh yeah, so is it Dengler? It sure looks that way, but we don't know it that it's that way. I'm curious about how Dengler would have gotten his hands on this information and we need to backtrack that and then you mentioned the peruvian his interest in peruvian archaeology yep, yep. Yes. and yeah. his grandfather all of this stuff dovetails with pre-columbian civilizations so do we so want nobody everybody? nobody else in this mess has that those interests right well, there's not that we're aware of. Yeah, we did not. Uh, you, you know, it's not like we had a lot of suspects or persons of interest to work with. So he is the first one we found. Uh, maybe you know anything about Derek Wheeler, his uh, grandpa, who supposedly is uh, some kind of undervalued genius in the field of Peruvian archaeology. Archaeology. So, if you if we find out more about him, maybe we can uh, secure a chain of uh, of knowledge, uh, uh, which we of course have to uh, have to cut because uh, the mission is to ensure it does not get out into the public. Uh, yeah. Do you want to make a roll, Agent Medicine? Yeah. So and let's see, humanly possible background and dark dye. Yeah, sounds about right. All ones across the board. <laughs> um, you can reroll. Uh, yeah, and what do I have to do to reroll, Mark? Uh, uh, reroll selected. Yeah, select them again and then reroll. Oh, oh, you mean mechanically? I got a six on the regular die and five on the dark die. Awesome. So, um, yeah, you definitely uh, remember uh, Derek Wheeler. He is, uh, he left academia. So, um, just to cl clarify, there was not a photo of uh, him and his grandfather. It was a photo of his grandfather, like a black and white picture. So, um, 
Uh, Derek Wheeler uh, left academia, I think, already in the 50s. Um, and he he was um, some kind of uh, archaeological uh, wunderkind. Um, he um, spent, he majored in uh, 23, um, participated in several uh, exploratory trips abroad. And um, during uh, a trip to Peru, he, um, he must have come across um, some kind of revelation because after that, his, um, um, his publications became a bit erratic uh, and he was shunned from the field. And um, so what you know in particular is, um, he basically got treated like I did. Yes. Except he wasn't a victim of some weirdness. Um, so you know that he has um, taken a lot of uh, artifacts from uh, Peru. Uh, and you know that, you know that he was um, specialized in um, the Moche, Shavin, Chivu, uh, and um, I think the uh, the, so the Shavin are coming up again because that was the culture before the Paracas yeah. that dealt with these winged beasts. Fantastic. And like the, the, the special uh, information you get is that he was kicked out of academia after he was... Um, uh, uh, if that is a word, about um, uh, being able to communicate with um, with demons. Uh, he said he would be able to um, talk to them and call them. <sighs> Listen, folks. This kid's family has always been tied up in dark shit. We know it's him. We've got the spell. So, so snatch and grab? What are you talking about doing here? I think we use our cover identities to take him in for questioning. Martyr, you and I are going to learn the spell. Make sure we've got it backward and forward. I'm sorry, Madison, but I'm not learning a spell. I, I fundamentally disagree with your approach. It's... Spells are bullshit. We're dealing with things from beyond time. We're dealing with things that are not going to be affected by bullets. And we can go talk to Dr. Wu right now. And Dr. Wu will be saying the same thing. We need to have someone else besides me learn the spell. And Martyr, uh, frankly, you're the person I trust most to do this. Absolutely no offense, Marlo. I mean, and, and, and Meyerhoff, honestly, this isn't stuff you need in your head. This is stuff that I don't want in my head. So I'm trying, I'm turning to the person who I think is most capable of coping with this you don't cope with this stuff you light it on fire burn it down stomp it spread the ashes salt the earth and this is the, this spell is part of how we do that it's a 16 year old kid you're talking about here like spread the ashes and stuff just that we are clear about what we are talking about right
it, we, what we're talking about is someone who has effectively invited possession. And the killings are not going to stop. This is... I'm at a loss here because every option we have is bad. Our best case scenario is less bad options. You say Our, you trust my judgment. Not I didn't say that I trusted your judgment. I said that I trust you to be the person who will actually follow through. There's a difference between the two. I trust you to be someone who will pull the trigger when the time is necessary. Well, you're right about that. And I'm going to give you the sternest look <laughs> one could give someone. Look, I realize I'm asking all of you to go on some intuition here. Intuitions all, all the fine. pieces, all the pieces fit. He has access to the information. It all makes sense. I mean, as much as anything like this can make sense, this makes sense. I agree with your conclusion that he has access to some kind of preternatural matters. I'm not sure about your uh, about your approach, and uh, I'm not sure about uh, stating as fact that these are things beyond time. Uh, my personal opinion would be that these are things not yet explained by science. Well, and, and, and honestly, magic is just a word for science that we haven't discovered yet. I agree with that. I'm a scientist. Oh, my but God. Can philosophy hour be over? Look. But we're also talking we, about things that have been around for 2,000 years. So I think beyond time is fair. Madison, uh, unless you want us to make a call to Marcus, I think looking around the room, you're outnumbered on this one. Do you understand? I understand. You are the spell repository. I'm not letting that shit in my head. And I really don't want to see that shit going in someone else's head. We... I, do you, well, no, of course, you don't know about what happened to Mike when well, Mike learned a spell. Fucked him up and almost fucked us all up. As an expert, you on, contain that. Yep, as an expert on disease, I agree. We should uh, treat uh, spells and uh, uh, preternatural containment of this matter as like. Uh, a mimetic disease, so we contain it if we use it as an antidote or a vaccination uh, for, let's say, the, the U.S. You, you know, the, the, humanity, that's really something point. we can use. Like a mimetic contagion. So, so how about middle ground? Because I want backup on this. I need a smoke. Does anyone need a smoke? I, Hell yeah! Light them up and pour another. Pour like give me, give me, a, give me a handful of whiskey. I want all four fingers and a thumb. Yeah, I bit into an apple just to spite them. <laughs> yeah, I think there's maybe a break here, uh, and I'll, I'll definitely go outside the box with uh, with Meyerhoff. Um, and I think Meyerhoff notices me grab underneath my my sweater uh, something, and I'm just kind of. I'm, it's I'm clicking it in my hands, and I think it's pretty clear that's a rosary. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it's so, ninety five. Why are you going outside to smoke? <laughs> I, I, I just want to throw out away is, from here. That's why. Is this a good stopping point, maybe, uh, from a story perspective, to pick up next time? <clears throat> yeah, it it it's. I mean. Or do we want to wrap this well, scene up? I'm yeah. waiting for the next session. Yeah, that, that is the problem. I, I would love to see some kind of um, conclusion to this. Uh, and if we have to, you know. If 
if the last thing we have is to confront this kid, yeah, like we could push it there. So if we all in, I, I have, agree, you have this middle ground suggestion. Okay. Because they do want backup on this. Can I call in Jensen? Yeah. All right. That means that none of you have to have the spell in your head. It's going into the, it's my backup is somebody who already knows the risks and has already been dealing with this stuff for a very long time. Is that, is that a reasonable middle ground? My question is, do you do you tell us? Because Martyr is going to be resistant to the idea of even using spells or magic or that kind of a thing. Like, I, I know I need to make a stress roll here in a minute at some point because the concept alone. I, I think at this point, given, given the resistance of the backup and everyone being adamant that this just stays in my head, I think I just, like, text jensen mm -hmm. like show up here like i'm not even calling him or talking to him so he just shows up wherever we wind up yeah and then all of you can be like what the, what the fuck is he doing here and i'm just like i told you i need backup i like that none of you would do this yeah it's it's a great day for jensen being invited to learn a spell and then kill a 16 year old <laughs> Um, so, um, what is everybody doing? Um, first, obviously, Agent Madison. You contact uh, Jensen and he just um, he, he texts back, I'll be there. And then you... I pour more bourbon. <laughs> okay. I mean, by this point, the, the bottle's got to be almost empty if it isn't yeah. dry. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm going to happily have some of that lunch that you guys brought us. Uh, I think I need a, re a recharge here. Um, and, and would you, you wait uh, at the storage facility? Um, do you check out Dengler or uh, his parents? Do you follow any of the leads? You don't have to play out the scenes, but just to we, see what... We talked, about, we talked about in chat, maybe um, it would not be that hard to, like, get school records if you're like an F flashing an fbi badge yeah maybe maybe if we need a yeah. role that makes sense but yeah mm -hmm. i think i think that marlo would probably go to the school offices flash the badge to the secretary go into either the vice principal or principal and go look we've seen that there's some strange activity in the area i'm not going to alarm you with what it is but I need to see records and files on the Stengler kid. And I want someone to go get me into that locker while class is in session so that it doesn't become a big rumor topic in the school. Mm -hmm. um, you get the information. Um, you, uh, you can see that he is a pretty um, quiet kid. Um, he was once uh, expelled from um, from the library for um, uh, unruly behavior and had to um, uh, to um, stay after class. Uh, and that was on sixth uh, of October. Um, in his locker, um, you don't find anything. Uh, like he has, um, like his school books, and um, one of them is an archaeology book. Was the librarian the one who asked him to stay over? Uh, yes, and Mrs. Oh, Hedlund, shit. Um confined him to uh, to stay after class. Is that book on archaeology from the school library or a college school no, it, library? It's from the school library. It's it's a more or less an introductionary book. All right, I'm just gonna leave that in the locker. I don't want to alarm this kid since I'm like get that date of when he was 
assigned attention essentially by the librarian and know that that's immediately preceded death and like, okay, don't want to get on the kid's list. <laughs> um, anything else you want to do before uh, Jensen uh, arrives? I just want to ask like the school counselor or principal if they know anything about his parents and what their relationship is like as a family unit. Yeah, um, the principal says that um, it's a very, um, you know, well-off uh, family. Um, Mark Dengler, his father, uh, works uh, as a components engineer, uh, and his uh, mother is a, a transcribes um, medical things for uh, the local hospitals. They're both um, interested in their kids. It's a very quiet home. Do we need to be concerned about Thomas? Uh, be watchful. Um, I won't be overt about that, but just be watchful for any sort of negative interactions Dengler might have with students or faculty. He's not and a suspect, is he? No, he's just a person of interest. But I'm going to give you this, and I pull out one of my fake business cards, and mm -hmm. it's I write the burner phone cell number on the back. I'm like, you can call me at this number anytime, 24 seven, if there's anything that you see that raises questions or concerns or alarms you. And I appreciate your time. Uh, anyone else doing anything? Um, the scientific findings, as they are, uh, I'll write them down and put them together with the gray staff into the green box so uh, uh, future generations of agents know what was going on should we fail. Smart move. Um, and uh, so medicine, uh, Jensen um, drives up to the uh, garage, um, sits down next to you, look, looks at the uh, empty bottle and says, he could have left me at least like a glass or something. Yeah, you already had some. I know you got one at your desk. So uh, I need backup. We don't need to discuss it in any detail. It's a spell of binding. You know the drill. So I I need a backup on this one. And the people that I'm working with are not comfortable with having this in their heads. And you are the literally the only other person that I could think to call. So I'm I know I'm asking a big favor from you. And I appreciate you being here. Hey um reaches over as if to touch you and then thinks the better of it and leans back and says have you read the spell yep like i said we don't need to discuss it in any detail who's the yeah we don't need to discuss it in any detail oh oh okay so none of them wanted it in their heads and i yeah where we do where will we do it right here and hey, martyr where, where 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 are we doing this well it outside says of here. town here I mean, uh, it's got to be someplace says, we can clean up. It says here his parents work till five. Kid gets off school at three. We arrive at four. All right. So I would be grateful if I wasn't exactly included in the uh, actual act. I can write you a workflow. Uh, 
for how to avoid uh, detection and make it look like uh, some kind of a drug related hit. I'm sure we can find some, I'm sure I saw something in the green box. We can plan to uh, make it look like he was involved in uh, some illegal activities. He's, uh, yeah, that is some, something a teenager, that people would believe a teenager was doing. And uh, that seems, uh, like uh, a good way to wrap this uh, with the information we gave the school because uh, they would of course suspect and call us suspect something was up and call us uh, which is a good thing because we uh, will be the line of information well that's quite thorough Meyerhoff um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't come to that uh... We are going to try and take this individual alive, uh, but so where 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 will you take him after you take him alive? Here, of course. I disagree with taking him here. Uh, our mission statement uh, clearly states that we should avoid uh, awareness of the. Uh, of data green to the public, and uh, if an investigation should follow, it might lead to the screen box. So we Meyerhoff, need a different place. I, I think we need to make this look like a drug hit. And to do that, out in the woods. I suppose part of me is hoping this is all still a misunderstanding, but OK. So, um, Agent Medicine, what is the plan from GM to player? What are you planning to do? Now, let's let that unfold as we go, shall we? <laughs> okay. And um, what are the steps? So, because we, we are running now, um, I would say let's wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. Um, who is doing what? I think at this point, Jensen and I are looking for a spot while yeah. Martyr and, oh God, these code names, Marlo are grabbing Dengler. Yeah. And, uh, well, Meyerhoff is probably eating a kiwi by this point. If it's, if it's cool with Marlo, I think that we would wait in a car near his bus stop. Uh, and, and grab him at the best opportunity. And yeah. to make sure, my, my hoof is fine with that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll let them do the actual work. I, I, I uh, briefed them uh, on how not to, uh, to leave traces, um, made a plan, maybe marked spots on, on a map of a, for the, the area. Then I will sit in another car uh, if it should it be needed with the burner phone beside me and uh, wait uh, for whatever news uh, are coming. Mm -hmm. And another question, um, Martia and Marlo are okay with, uh, with snatching the kid? It's pretty clear we need to do something. I, yeah, it's gonna grab the kid, handcuff him, and then and get them was... somewhere to question. Okay. There's probably, yeah. probably, thinking about it, part of this has to be going through his room too, which we should have access to since no one should be home. Uh, mm -hmm. poten potentially, if we don't find anything on him. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, so is uh, Martia and Marlo, are you assuming that this is just questioning or do you assume that um, something, somebody will hurt the kid? Uh, nothing's off the table at this point. Marlo would like to potentially neutralize the threat if there's some way to do that, but you know, our mission objective was clearly says eliminate the threat. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, I think that warrants uh, a stress role. Uh, if you think that, you know, before that you were relatively innocent. 
Yeah, uh, it, it weren't yeah. stressful for Maya for sure. She that's not what she planned to do. She's just a very analytical person who who breaks it down into steps people need to do. But yeah, she's emotionally she's not okay with this. Yeah, this is a very negative realization for Marlo. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll I'll roll as well. Okay. Marjorie is hoping every step of the way that we don't have to do what she's pretty sure we're gonna have to do. Uh and so when you go, where where do you you pick him up on the from the bus stop? And um, we can, you know, um, we don't have to go through the, the whole details, but he's resisting. Uh, what do you do? He's resisting in the sense like he's uh, he's not fighting or anything, but he's saying he's a, he's a, like a normal kid. He has a um, suede uh, jacket. He has some of the uh, bands as. Um, you know, on his, uh, he is, um, I don't oh, know. like Letterman uh, jacket. Yeah. I'm and just going to do total popo move on him and just like pull the hands right behind the back, cuff him and just manhandle him. Okay. I'm going to use my mass and intimidation, uh, <clears throat> just like either frog march him up to his house or whatever we need to do. Yeah, I think it, it would be interesting to see um, how much um, people uh, become aware of you um, arresting him. So if your goal is to be um, pretty subtle about this, um, you roll. If you don't care, you don't have to roll, I think. I'll go ahead and roll because I'm trying to do it. Yeah. Subtly, and if I miss the roll, then that's where obviously I had to get more physical than I wanted it to be. So, humanly possible, and it's within my skill set. I rolled a failure die just for shits and giggles. All right, so I got a five. You got a four in the fail failure. Oh, you got a five also. On a tie, Justin? Yeah, so on a tie, it's whoever has the highest insight because normally players can. Yeah. Cause failures too. In this case, I think it would be a roll off. And uh, you have to roll the dark die if you're going to roll again, is the big thing. Okay. <laughs> Story wise, that's more interesting, anyways. Yeah. I've got a three. I got a four. My dark die is a two. Yeah. So he, um, he, you just subdue him. He he, um, he seems to accept his fate, whatever that is. Um, and so you go to uh, his house, check his room, and you can find um, uh, check him. He has um, like under his uh, under his shirt, he has an amulet, like a clay amulet. Um, and uh, it, it shows uh, a winged figure and uh, a human figure um, seemingly embracing each other. Uh, and in, the, in his room, if you search his room, you find in the trunk um, other, like um, the diary of uh, Derek Wheeler um, and uh, more of uh, Derek Wheeler's books. Why the hell are you doing this, kid? Um, it's it's just fascinating. It's a fascinating topic. What? Why am I here? What? What? Who are you? Are you even aware that you've caused the death of three people? What? I caused the death. What? I did cause the death of. Lauren or of of Miss Hedron? What, what what are you talking about? I love I'm Lauren. Gonna, I'm gonna look to Meyerhoff, and there's kind of a sad realization coming in here, where I think that this kid may not have even known, 
like the consequences of his yep. actions here. And, and Marlo literally says actions have consequences, kid. It's repercussions <laughs> for messing with this shit, and you've been noticed. I didn't do anything. I, I read a couple of books. Out loud, maybe? No. Come on. Nobody's interesting in this. I'm, I'm the loser, so to speak. I'm the nerd. Who, who would I read that to? Things. It's the way it usually works. I think that is a role to, um, to get him to say what he maybe actually believes. All right, so that's humanly possible. I think questioning people is probably part of yeah. my professional skill set. Okay. And I'm going to roll the dark die because there's a good chance I'm going to get to hear something I don't like. I might like to roll with you, too. Okay. Oh, only a one on the dark die, six on my uh, profession. So the kid is telling the truth, but you can also see in his eyes that there is a truth that he doesn't want to um, tell himself. Like deep down, he knows that it is related, but he never conjured something um, consciously. I think about now is when we get to the agreed upon yeah. spot. We cut so to speak. the spot. Um, so, um, Medicine, how does the, the ritual look like? I'm putting you on the spot here. Oh, that's okay. I, I apologize. I had it muted. I'd already started. <laughs> okay. There is a ring of salt that's already on the ground in a circle. There are some esoteric markings scattered around in what looks like blood, but it, well, considering it's on dirt, it can be kind of difficult to tell. Madison says, put them in the circle, but don't disturb the salt. Pick them up, put them in there. Uh, I think they uh, agree. Um, and I think the, um, you know, there's a, ch a weird change in Thomas' behavior as if he, like talking to Agent Marlowe, led him to the realization that um, he is the sacrificial lamb. He's not uh, fighting back. He's, his head is, um, you know, uh, his head is down and he follows your orders. I'm sorry about this kid. Some right. things, there's stuff in forgotten corners of the world that is best left forgotten. And your family dug into some of it. This is just. You know those stories about bombs from World War II? This is kind of your family's version of it, and you just got hit by some shrapnel. I, I loved her so much. Yeah. Unfortunately, with this kind of stuff, love's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> hey, Jensen. Start with the spell. And now comes the um, the tricky part. Who is the human sacrifice? Oh, I, I'm i sorry. Was was that unclear uh, at any uh, point? Wait, what? <laughs> well, there are a couple of possibilities. Um, Jensen, you know good and goddamn well who the human sacrifice is. And Martyr? God damn it. This is why I wanted you to learn the spell. 
I already told you I to I, that you are the only person I trusted to pull the trigger when it came down to it. I've been living way too long with this shit in my head. I'm tired of panicking every time the phone rings. Every time my sister says that there's been numbers on the other line. I'm stopping murders. I made a promise to her mom that I would kill this fucking thing. And that is exactly what I'm doing. But unlike everybody else in this mess, at least I get to make a choice. So Martyr, when Jensen tells you to, you pull that fucking trigger. Do you understand? And you tell my sister that I took a bullet to save someone. You tell her something that'll help her sleep better at night. Okay? I think with talk like this, my hand is already on the gun for sure. Okay, so um, Jensen starts reading from the um, from the scroll, and there's uh, it's now it's night, it's night time. Um, and then within the circle, there is, uh, it's as if within the circle of salt, there is a wind going that is not uh, outside of the circle. And what you can all see is the longer um, uh, Jensen chants the same words over and over again, um, the more the form uh, manifests within the circle. And it is as if somebody has cut out reality in a, in a grotesque shape. And what is behind it is like um, a dark, uh, is, the, is the darkness of space. You can see like um, stars shining from behind reality. And the form that unfolds is roughly um, humanoid, a bit taller. It has three, um, uh, three wings that unfold in, in strange ways. Um, you can't see any details of the creature itself. Uh, it, is, it also looks as if um, like, the, like reality is curving towards the space that is missing uh, and is warped. Um, so it's not that the creature is moving, but as if the rest of the world is moving and the creature stands still. Um, it does have um, eight eyes that are uh, unsymmetric on its on its head, uh, and I think it seems as if the the moment is when um, Jensen commands it. And I don't know if we should resolve it with a roll, if that is um, successful. Maybe um, medicine, your part in the ritual. All right. So background, he, oh, this is definitely a dark die. Roll. It's, it's just the dark die. We've got a three on the dark die. So a three um, seems to be... Um, uh that's a miss but it also raises his his stress and insight i think <laughs> yeah that, that's the least of his problems i think yes um so the the creature manifests and um jensen commands it um Marta, what are you doing i think that the last seal is missing uh, well, I'm frightened by this because this doesn't seem like what we were asking for. You know, he, he told us this was a ritual of binding. And now I'm concerned that we're, we're having, you know, this, this is a classic. I've only heard of agents breaking before like this, but uh, this is what I'm thinking. And I, I'm going to raise the pistol uh, 
you know, and stop me if this is too much, but I'm going to raise the pistol to Agent Madison uh, with the intent to to stop him if if he doesn't, you know, shout him like, stop what you're doing, you know, put your hands down, that kind of thing. And if and if he doesn't, I'm going to fire. Um, is that how the session ends with um, with Marta raising raising the pistol, and when we hear the gunshot? Or do you want to see how the, the three manifests? Is that a veil, veil thing, or what do you guys I'm think? A, well, I'm okay with it not being veiled, but that's up to the rest of you. I mean, one, once... Yeah, at least know, two characters will be traumatized by this, so maybe we should get uh, some details. Yeah. Um, so Agreed. I think... Yeah. So, um, yeah, Marty, how do you kill uh, Agent Medicine? Is it like a like a clean headshot? Is do you look uh, away? Or? It's it's. I think my hands are shaky, and that's pretty unusual for me. I think I I spend a lot of time at the range, uh, but um, I I think I hit you once. It center a mass, and that probably isn't enough to do it, so I have to fire a second shot to to put you down. Um, and then there's definitely a few moments there where I'm not sure if that will stop what's happening here um, or not. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to work. So um, medicine um, falls down. Is bleeding out. Um, the the shape is uh, is um, flickering, but it is not vanishing. And um, you know, over in, in the meantime, now that it's like a storm inside of the circle. Uh, who's in the inside the circle? There's uh, definitely Dr. Jensen. Um, I think Martia. Or are you outside? No, I can be in because I think I was close by. Um, I think I'm going to yell to the other agents, uh, you know, like the medallion, where's the medallion, that kind of a thing. Martyr, you've got to fucking kill me. God damn it. Shoot straight and don't make a fucking mess of it. Is this a role for me to finish it quickly? Um, no, I think I think um, when when uh, there's probably the last words of Agent Medicine, and then uh, you know the the blood is um, you know going into her, um, you know blocking the vocal cords and everything. Um, but the the sacrifice seems to be not enough, and uh, you you hear Jensen shouting over the storm, "We need another one." Marlo grabs Dangler, lifts him up bodily, drops him inside the circle, pulls out his service weapon, fires three shots. That is the best ending I can imagine. Um, obviously, there will be, um, what's it called? Sanity rolls. Uh, I assume by uh, upon seeing the creature, Upon seeing um, Agent Marlowe in cold blood killing uh, Thomas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to roll one of these light blue die here. Did that role risk insight as well? Yeah. Seeing and uh then I yeah. think what I'm doing is I'm actually gonna resist that die roll by um thinking back uh to the day I left uh my ex-husband's house, Robin Greer, whose whose name I still have, by the way. Um and the whole reason I think that I left uh, him was to protect him from this this crazy stuff that I was getting mixed mixed up in, 
Um, and so I'm, I'm striking out his name for now. Uh, and we'll resolve that in a home scene if we get there. Awesome. How, uh, how about the rest? Um, Marlo and uh, Mayhof. Like, how does the um, does your stress level arise, and how does it manifest? What do we see? Well, Marlo's stress level definitely has to go up. And <clears throat> And I think the only way that Marlo can justify it to himself is that he's trying to clean up the world or whatever for his wife and unborn child. Awesome. And, um, I mean, do you um, put a strain on your bond? No, you just accept that the stress is, is there. I accept that the stress is there, although I think, you know, if we play a home scene out, I think there's going to be all this tension because he's been so withdrawn since he came back and he's like almost afraid to be around her because yeah, he, I would love he really believes the contagion thing now. Yeah. I would love to have a scene uh, maybe next time because we're really running late. Uh, because um, Kevin will be there next time and Jasmine as well. Um, Jasmine, your stress is raised? It's uh, at three, yeah. Yeah. And so maybe a, um, I don't know, let's close this, uh, this session. I really enjoyed myself, I think, um, uh, like Agent Medicine's uh, sacrifice was absolutely awesome. Um, Pocket, you won't be uh, here next time, I think. Yeah, but I'll be back for session three. Uh, awesome. Uh, because I really in enjoyed the, the character and your um, playing her. So good to have you for the third Thank session. You. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, you were great, Pocket. I the whole story arc you put together in a single game here was fantastic. Yep, I have to second that. Some all-star role-playing. <laughs> awesome, guys. Um, I mean, I would love to have um, feedback on the system, maybe. I don't know if we have the time, because we're really like an hour over the time. Notes and Hangouts? I yeah. Mean, that would be great. Yeah, that would be cool. Yep, I'm happy to do that. All right. I will see you all week after next. Yes. All right. Excellent. Have a so great much day. Playing. And see you Thank all you. guys. All right. Be well. Thank Have you. Have a good Have afternoon. Bye-bye. All right.